Have you ever wanted to know how to implement a fully featured authentication system using JSON Web Tokens, account activation, password reset, and social login? Well, we're going to cover all of that in this series. Not just that you're going to develop this application through the series, you're also going to be deploying it so that you can see how a deployment works with this type of application. And you'll even see how to configure a custom domain as well, just like you can see up here. The deployment itself will be doing on DigitalOcean and we'll use things like DigitalOcean's domain management to help set up our custom domains. We we'll use the DigitalOcean app platform to help with easily deploying our backend and front end. And we'll be using DigitalOcean Spaces as a static file storage service. And then we'll also be using AWS Simple Email Service to help with sending emails in our application. So here inside of DigitalOcean, this is kind of like the setup just so that you can see what we're ultimately going to end up getting to. So I've got the custom domain. I have DigitalOcean Spaces holding the static files. And then also with App Platform, I have the back end deployed as well as the front end. And then the front end is on this domain and then the back end is on this subdomain. So that's kind of the setup that we're ultimately going to get to. To implement this app itself, we'll be using Django with the Django REST framework for the backend API. And Django REST Framework, in case you don't know, is a library that gives Django more features to help with putting together REST API endpoints very easily. And then for a database, we'll use SQLite 3 when we're on our development environment, and then we'll use Postgres when we're in our production environment. And then for static file storage, we'll handle this differently in development and production. So during development, we'll handle it more like the standard way you do with Django. And then in production, we'll have our static files stored in the digital ocean spaces. Also just something to note, for this particular app, setting up the static file storage in this way is pretty overkill since there will barely be any static files in this particular app. But the reason I implemented this way is just so that you can see how you can do the sort of setup. And then also because realistically, you'll never have an app that does just authentication and that's it. Typically an app that has authentication will have tons of other features built on top of it as well. For example, you might have a social media app and then you can have users that store all kinds of posts and images. And then in that kind of case, a solution for static file storage like I have implemented here would be a lot more effective. So just wanted to put that out there just so that it's clear why we're doing things the way that we do them in this app. And then other things to note with the backend, we'll be setting up a custom user model and then that way users can register and log in using an email and password. We'll be using the Joser library to help us quickly put together a fully featured authentication backend API. And then you'll also see how to easily overwrite certain behaviors in a library. And then that way you can get it to do something specific to what you want in your particular use case in your app. And then what we're gonna be overriding in particular in our app is how the JSON Web Token authentication endpoints behave, as well as how the authorization behaves. So by default, the way that things will behave is that when you hit an endpoint to create your JSON Web Token credentials, you'll get back in the response data, your access and refresh tokens. And then you'll also need to store them somewhere. And then to make authorized requests, you'll have to pass an authorization header, and then you're gonna have your access token in there of the value in that header. We'll be changing this behavior so that instead the access and refresh tokens get stored in cookies with the HTTP only flag set to true. So that way client side JavaScript won't be able to read the values of these credentials and they're gonna be stored in a very secure way as a result. And then we're also gonna see how we can override the authorization so that you don't need to pass an authorization header, but instead you'll just have the access token, which is in a cookie, and then you'll just extract that value and use that to make the authorized request. Then we're also going to see how to implement social authentication with this app. And we're gonna be using Google and Facebook OAuth 2 in order to implement this. Now for the front end, to build out the front end, we'll be using Next.js 13 with the app router. We'll be using Tailwind CSS for the styling along with things like headless UI. We'll also be using Redux Toolkit for our global state management for the authentication and RTK query for our client side requests. And then these will be the authentication requests because that's the only feature we really have in this app. So you'll see how to configure this setup with Next.js 13's app router. Then another thing that we'll set up with RTK query is automatic reauthorization. So this means that anytime we hit an API endpoint where we're unauthorized to make the request, which will frequently happen because we'll have access tokens that expire after five minutes, 
what will happen in this case is that when we get this unauthorized response, we'll automatically in our app hit a refresh endpoint using the refresh token that's stored in our cookies. We'll get back a new access token, and then we'll retry the unauthorized request with the new access token, which will now be valid. And so the request will work during the retry. Now, I just wanna point out that in this particular app with this setup, we won't be taking advantage of certain things in Next.js 13, such as the server-side data fetching. So our app will instead be doing client-side data fetching and caching with RTK query. So currently with RTK query, we can only make client-side requests with the server components, and that's why we're doing that in our particular app. However, in an app that builds on top of having authentication, you would technically have many features that could take advantage of things like server-side data fetching. So for example, an e-commerce app is something that you could build on top of this authentication system, and that will have things like product data, which is a great use case for things like server-side data fetching of the products. And then when you're on like a shop page or product detail page, in that case, you could take advantage of these sorts of things. But in our app, since we're using RTK query with the automatic reauthorization setup for our authentication endpoints, we'll only be doing client-side data fetching. So that's just something I wanted to put out there. Anyway, that is an overview of what we'll be going over in this series. And next I'll go over the actual app itself. And as you can see on the screen, this is an app that is running in a production environment on DigitalOcean with our DigitalOcean setup right over here. But before I get into the overview of the app, make sure to hit that like button on the video if you haven't done so already. Helps the YouTube algorithm so that more people can find this kind of content. Also hit that subscribe button if you wanna see more content like this and hit that notification bell if you wanna be notified when I release new videos. And with that, let's get into the overview. So here we can see, this is the homepage styled with Tailwind CSS. We have our nav bar, we have our footer, and then we have our login and create an account buttons that we can click. So I can go to create an account, that'll bring me to the sign up page. So let's go ahead and sign up for an account. So I'll sign up with a John Doe account. So there we go, we put in the credentials and then you can also sign up with Google and Facebook, but first I'll show this. So I'll click the sign up button. Now we're also gonna have alerts in this app. So these will be handled with React Toastify. So here we can see an alert for please check email to verify account. So I can now go into my email. Then if I refresh, I should receive an email. So this one ended up going in the promotions tab. So let's make sure it's over here. I'll click on this and now I get a link. So I see you're receiving this email because you need to finish the activation process on full auth, which is the name of our app. And then please go to the following page to activate the account. So I can just click on this and there we go. Account activated, just like that. So now I can log in with this account. And there we go, we're logged in. And now we see we're on a dashboard page. We also see our nav bar was updated. So now we have a dashboard and a logout button. So I can see I have the first name John, last name Doe, email. So all of the things that I signed up with on this account. I can go back to the home page, dashboard, logout. I can refresh the page. I'm still logged in. So in this particular case, we use things like our verify route in order to make sure that we have a valid access token. And if we end up being unauthorized, because let's say more than five minutes passes, so our access token expires, when we refresh the page, we're gonna get a 401 response. So we're gonna go hit the refresh endpoint automatically, get back a new access token and retry the verify route, which will then succeed and keep us logged in. I can also open up the console along with the application and then here, I'm gonna have to log out and then re-log in just so that we can see the access and refresh tokens here. So if I log out, go to login, and then I log in. So I'm gonna see that the access token is here along with the refresh token. And then we can see some other properties on this as well. So we can see that the domain is set up, the path, when it expires, the HTTP only flag, which is an important one. So these cookies here, they cannot be accessed with client-side JavaScript because of this setting here. 
They also have to be secure, so they need an HTTPS connection. And then we also have same site as none, and this is because our front end and our back end are on different domains. Our front end is on this domain, and then the back end is on a subdomain. So we're also gonna see how to do that setup so that this works properly and the cookies get sent in the requests. And yeah, so now back in the app, if I'm on the dashboard page, I click log out, I'll get navigated to the sign-in page. So now the next thing I'm gonna show is the forgot password. So if I click on this, I can put in my email. And then I'm gonna request a password reset. So request sent, check your email for reset link. So I can go back, I'll get a new email, password reset on full auth. So now I can click on this link. And then here I'm prompted to put in a new password. So let's go ahead and do that. And then it seems that I didn't have these passwords match. So this is also a great thing. It shows what happens if the passwords don't match, it won't end up working. Now, if they do match, there we go. Password reset successful. So now I'm gonna try to log in with the old password. And if I try to log in with the old password, I should not be able to log in. So there we go, failed to log in. So now if I put in my new password and sign in with that, there we go, it works. So that is the password reset. And then only one more thing to showcase in this app, and that is the Google sign-in and Facebook sign-in. So if I click on the Google sign-in, here's the Google sign-in page. I can click on this account, and there we go. I'm logged in with that account. And then the final thing to showcase will be the Facebook OAuth 2. So if I click on this button instead, there we go, I'm logged in. And I can also see that the first name and last name is slightly different than the other account because these are the details on the Facebook account for this email. So we can see that now we have an email and a password login, we have account activation, we have password reset, and we have social authentication with Google and Facebook OAuth 2. So that is the complete overview for this particular app. And now what I'm gonna do is in the first video, I'm just gonna go over the whole setup for just the backend API. So that's gonna be with Django. And then the second part in this series is going to be just the Next.js setup. So that way, if you're interested in just say Next.js, then you can just go to the second part in the series and then you'll just have to configure the backend API so that it works on your local system. And then from there, you can just see how you can implement this sort of authentication system on the front end with Next.js app router. But if you're interested in just the backend API, I'm gonna cover that in this video. And if you're interested in both, then you can go through both parts of the series. So with that, let's now jump in and see how we can put together this Django backend. All right, now let's see how we can build out this Django backend API for this project. So right now I have VS Code open, which will be my text editor of choice. And then I have a folder open called full auth API. And then this right now is sitting inside of a full auth folder. So I'm gonna have my backend API with Django and I'm also gonna have my Next.js project in here as well, just to organize things. So before I get started, I'm just gonna show some of the VS Code extensions I'm using. So I have this auto rename tag, which is pretty handy. This one's more handy for when we get to the next JS stuff. Also I have auto pep eight as the Python formatter. And then there's this Django extension, which is more useful for when you're working with templates, .env, just for some syntax highlighting with .env files. And then we also have this React Redux snippets extension. So this one, you get these little commands you can put in and then click tab and then it'll just auto generate some stuff. Now, personally, I don't really use this one that much, but it is a useful one. I would just have to get used to some of the shortcuts. And then we also have prettier, which is the code formatter that I use, except with Python, I'll be using AutoPep 8 instead. Then we also have this PyLance and Python extension. And then we also have Tailwind. So that's gonna be something once we get to the next JS part. So those are my extensions. So the next thing I'm gonna do is open up a terminal. So the version of Python that I'm using right now is 3.11.3. .3. And then I'm gonna set up a virtual environment. So I can do that with Python 3-m, then venv, and then venv. 
So this is the command, this is the name of the folder where I'm gonna have the virtual environment and this way I can have my Python packages installed in a virtual environment instead of on my global system. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is activate this virtual environment with source vamp bin activate. And if you're on Windows, this will look something like dot backslash vem backslash scripts backslash activate dot bat. Although one thing I do recommend if you are on Windows is you can also set up Windows subsystem for Linux. That way you can have an Ubuntu environment on your Windows system. Then there's some extensions you can have in VS Code to work with that. So then you would just go here and then you could connect to your WSL environment. And then that way you can use the Ubuntu terminal, which you'd be using bash instead of using the command line with Windows. And it's just a nicer way to develop when you're on Windows. So the next thing I'm gonna do is install some packages I need. So I can do that using pip install. And then also right now inside of my virtual environment, by the way, if I do Python dash dash version, right now I don't have to use Python 3 because the default version of Python in my virtual environment is already this. Same with pip. So I don't have to do things like pip3 install. I can just use pip install. So one thing I'm gonna need is Django REST Framework. And Django REST Framework has a dependency of Django, so I don't have to specify Django here as well. I can just install Django REST Framework and that will, behind the scenes, install Django as well. I'm also gonna need Joser. This is gonna be my library for managing authentication in this project. And then another thing I'm gonna need is Django Core's headers. So we're gonna need course headers in this project because our backend API and our front end is going to be on separate ports and also separate domains. So in particular, when we're in a development environment, it'll be separate ports because the backend will be on localhost 8000, the front end will be localhost 3000. And then because we're gonna have authentication and we're gonna be using cookies, we're gonna need course headers in order to allow cross origin requests to happen. And then in a production environment, we're also gonna have different domains because our backend API is gonna be on a subdomain. So it's gonna be like API dot whatever the domain is, dot com, let's say. And then the front end will just be the domain.com. So it'll be different domains. So we're also gonna need to set up course headers to allow those cross origin requests. And then the last thing I'm gonna install for now is python.env. This way we can have a dot env file where we can have environment variables. So all of those installed now, so I'm gonna clear. And now if I do a pip freeze, so these are now all the packages that we have. And this is in the virtual environment. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a requirements.txt file, which is gonna have all of those dependencies. So I'm gonna do pip freeze, then this greater than sign, and requirements.txt. So now inside of here, I have all of those dependencies right here. The next thing I'm gonna do is generate the Django project. So I can do that with Django-admin start project. I'm gonna call this full underscore auth. And I'm gonna put a dot so that it gets made in the current directory. And then I don't have full auth and then another full auth folder. So I'll show you what I mean. So if I don't put that dot inside of here, I'd have another full auth folder and that would have all of this inside of there. So I didn't want that. So that's why we put this for the current directories where I wanna have this project present. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create the app. So I'm gonna have only one app and that's gonna be a user's app, which is gonna be for managing users and authentication. So anything custom I need with authentication, which I will need in this project. So I can do that with python manage.py start app, and I'm gonna call it users. So here we used Django admin, but once we created the project, we got this manage.py. So now instead we can run these commands like start project and start app by using this instead. So it'll be python manage.py, your command, and whatever options it has. So there we are. Now we have our users app. And then the other thing I'm gonna make is my .env. So I'm gonna do a .env.local, and this is where I'm gonna set up my environment variables for my development environment. 
So I'm gonna close this for now. I'm gonna come back to this later. For now, I'm gonna go to my settings because this is where I'm gonna start configuring some things. Now, in this particular project, we're gonna end up deploying things to DigitalOcean. So I'm gonna do that a little bit later. But one thing that I'm gonna be using to kind of help out with that whole process is there's this link to deploying a Django app on app platform with DigitalOcean. Then a lot of these steps in here are gonna be very similar to what we do in this project. And I'm also gonna have a link to this in the description below. So shows you creating your virtual environment and then creating the Django project. So we're kind of going through those steps. And then later on, there's some project setup things. They kind of start right here, actually. So let's say for setting your secret key, you can use an environment variable of Django secret key, and then you can also use this utility function to generate a random key. So we're gonna be doing things similar to this. So I'm gonna show that setup right now. So inside of here, at the top, I'm gonna to do from OS, I'm gonna import get env. So this is what we're gonna to use to get our environment variables. Another thing I'm gonna need is to import dot env. So that was that python.env package that gives me support for the .env file right here and getting the environment variables from there because by default, I can't get those environment variables from this kind of file. Instead, they would have to be environment variables set up on my system itself. So this just makes development a little bit easier. And then below here, another import I'm actually gonna need is gonna come from OS as well. It's called path. Then what I'm gonna do is set .env file. This is gonna be base directory and then .env.local. So this is gonna be this file I made here. Then I'm gonna check if path.isfile.env file. So if this is a file, then I'm gonna do .env.load.env, the .env file. So I'm gonna load the environment variables from this if this exists. So in our production environment, this is not gonna exist. So we're not gonna be doing this loading of the .env file. Instead, we're gonna have more like global environment variables on there. But in our development environment, this just makes things a lot more convenient. So I don't have to go into my terminal and set up global environment variables. And it also complicates things if you're on a Windows system and you wanna set up these environment variables. So this is a much better development experience. So I'm gonna save that. Also, when I save here, I get this little suggestion. You have the AutoPep 8 formatter extension installed and would you like to use it as a default formatter? Yes, I would, because my default formatter right now is prettier, but I'd rather use AutoPep 8. So then it'll just create this .vs code folder and then in there there's this settings JSON where it just sets this up. And then I'm gonna go back. So right here I have this whole secret key set up. So I'm just gonna copy this And then I'll go paste right over here. So right now, I don't have to do os.getenv since I just imported this directly. So my secret key, that's gonna be equal to this. And then I need this import as well. So that's right here. So this will just generate a random secret key. And then I can just cut this. So this is how I'm gonna set the secret key up now. And then also I'd rather use single quotes, so I'll do that. And then inside of here, I can do Django secret key is equal to this. And actually I put an extra quote here. So there we go. So now we have this environment variable that's gonna get loaded up by this, and then we'll be using it here. Then if you don't have this set, then you're just gonna generate a random one. But I'd rather just have one set up in here. So that way, every time my server kind of reboots, I don't wanna generate a brand new key, especially because we're gonna be using JSON of token authentication. And then we're gonna have like the cryptography, it's gonna be using this secret key so that every time it changes, then your access tokens aren't gonna to work. So I'd rather just have one that's kind of in place. So every time my server restarts, I hold that value. And the next thing I'm gonna do is tackle this setting. So here we have debug is equal to this right here. So we're gonna get an environment variable 
of debug. And by default, it's going to be false. And then environment variables are always strings. So you have to do it like this. You can't just grab it and use like a value of true. Otherwise it's gonna be like the string true or the string false. So you have to do this kind of comparison. And then by default, we're gonna have this be false equals true, which is gonna evaluate to a Boolean of false. So that way in our production environment, we don't have to set this thing, it'll just be false. And then in our development environment, we will have to set it. So here I'll do debug is true. And again, this will be the string true. And now if I put quotes around it, or if I don't, it's the exact same thing. So you can use whatever syntax you want inside of here. Then the next thing I'm gonna do is tackle the allowed hosts. So that's right here. And then I'll paste that right here. So we're gonna get an environment variable of Django allowed hosts, which by default is going to be our local host environment. And we do this dot split. We're just going to split this into an array. And also, by the way, if you, let's say, had only one item here and you did a dot split, it would be an array with just one item. So that would work. You don't need to have the comma there. So I saved and that reformatted things. Now I'm gonna tackle my installed apps. So we have Django REST framework in this project. So I have the documentation open here. That'll be the first thing I set up. So we need to install it, which we did. You have to put it in your installed apps. And also if you wanna use the browsable API, you can also set up this here, but I won't be using the browsable API. Instead to test out my API, I'll be using Postman. So let's put this in here. So we got REST framework. Next, we gotta set up these settings. So I'm just gonna copy this example here. And I'll scroll down. And I can put that, say, below the static settings. I'll remove these comments. And then for my default permission classes, instead of having this here, I'm gonna have is authenticated. So what this is gonna do is on all of my views, by default, we have to be authenticated. And then if we're not, we're gonna get a 401 unauthorized. So if we wanna overwrite this, then we can set a different permission. For example, we can have permissions of allow any, and we have to specifically define it on the view. But I want by default the behavior to be is authenticated. So that's gonna be for the permission classes. We're also gonna have authentication classes. In particular, we're gonna be using JSON Web Token authentication. But well, we can also go inside of Django REST framework, inside of authentication. And then here you can see the setting that you need to set for authentication classes. So that's this one here. And that has some examples of, let's say, basic authentication, session authentication. But ours, of course, is going to be the JWT authentication. I'm going to set up that setting here. And then that's going to be a list. And then this is where we're going to set that. So right now we have the Joser library that we're using. And that's also one of the suggested libraries in here. So third party packages, Joser. And then here you can see that. It's a library that provides views for handling basic actions like registration, login, logout, password reset, account activation. So all of that we get with this. And then behind the scenes when we're doing the JWT authentication, so I have the documentation open for it. It's one of these, uh, let's see which one, ah, oh, this one. So here, if we also have this JWT endpoints and then these JWT endpoints they're gonna be using the simple JWT package. So then I also have the simple JWT documentation. And then here we can take a look at some of the settings it has. You can go to the settings and then you can see the default settings. And then there's also how you can set this to be your default authentication class. So I think it shows it somewhere yeah, here. So default authentication classes, you will put this right here and that will use the JWT authentication then. So that is what I'm gonna paste right here. So now I have my authentication classes and my permission classes set up. And then also just to show with Joser that it's using the simple JWT package behind the scenes, you can also go in your virtual environment, you can look for Joser 
And then here you have URLs JWT and you can see it's using the simple JWT package and it's just setting up these endpoints and behind the scenes just using the views from there. So we have things like the token obtain pair view, refresh view, verify view, and the endpoints for that. All right, so now with that, we can go into our urls.py. Just gonna remove the documentation comment there. I'm gonna have a path, which is gonna be API slash. And there, I need to bring in include. And then I'm gonna include joser.urls. So joser.urls, this isn't gonna give me the JWT URLs, it's only gonna give me the other ones. If I want the JWT URLs, I have to do API slash and then include joser.urls.jwt. Then I think it shows that in the documentation for joser, uh, that's this one here. And then if we go to settings, or not settings, that's gonna be all of our settings. I'm not sure exactly where it is in the documentation, it might be in the getting started. But anyway, we will need this. So here we have Joser that we have to put in our installed app. So let's just go ahead and do that. So back in my settings, I'm gonna scroll up and I'm gonna put Joser right over here. And then it shows you how to set up the URLs. So you just include joser.urls. And then for JWT, I'm not sure exactly where it shows it. I would expect it to be in the JWT endpoints or maybe somewhere else, perhaps sample usage. <laughs> no, it's not sample usage. But anyway, that's how you would set up the JWT endpoints. Now, once we have the simple JWT package set up, so these are all of the default values. So we have, let's say the access token lifetime, five minutes, refresh token lifetime, one day, then rotate refresh tokens falls, blacklist after rotation falls, and so on and so forth. And then also one thing that's in here is our signing key. So the signing key, that's the thing that uses our secret key. So this is the reason why I wanted to have in the environment variable the secret key, because every time it changes, the signing key will be different and then your JWT authentication won't work you're gonna have to re-sign in. And then re-signing in when you're using JSON Web Tokens is just creating a new access token. And that's because you use your access token for authorization. So if you wanted to overwrite any of the settings in here, you would just put a simple JWT setting, which will be your dictionary. You can overwrite any of these settings, but I will be sticking to the defaults. So I don't need this open anymore. Also don't need this open anymore. And then one thing I will need is the settings in Joser because we're going to be setting these up. So going back to the code, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here. And then also while I'm at it, I might as well set this up. So I'm going to have my static root, which will be base directory static. And then I'm also going to set up media URL and media root. So for the media, this is going to be where you have things like photos and videos and whatnot. Now, I'm not gonna be using that in this project, but it is very common to have it in a project. So I'm just gonna include it here. And then for media roots, it'll be base directory media. And then below my rest framework settings, this is where I'm gonna have my Joser settings. This will be my dictionary. And let's see what we need to set up. So the first setting we see here is the user ID field. So this will be the name of a unique field in the user model. This is something we can just stick to the default. We have the login field. So login field, this is gonna be set to user.username field, but this is something that will be overwritten once we create our custom user model. So we can just stick to the default on this. Then we have our password reset confirm URL. So this is gonna be a setting I'm gonna set up. So back in here, I'm gonna paste this. And I'm gonna set this to password-reset and then UID and token. And then we also have username reset confirm URL. So this is gonna be when you're resetting a username, which in our case would be an email. Now I'm not gonna include this one just because we're not gonna be doing a username reset, which in our case is an email reset. Now you 
can include this if you want. And it's very similar to how it works with the password reset. So once you know how to do this one, you'll know how to do this one as well. But I'll just skip that one. And then we have send activation email. So this by default is false, but I will want this to be true just because when someone creates an account, I'm gonna want them to get an activation email where then they're gonna have to click a link and activate their account. So I'm gonna set this to true. And then we have send confirmation email. So once someone registers or activates, then send a confirmation email. So I don't wanna send a confirmation email, so I'll stick to the default of false. And then password changed email confirmation. So when someone changes their password, I don't really wanna send a confirmation email, so I'll leave this at false. And then username changed email confirmation. We're not gonna be doing the username changing, so I'll just keep this as false. Then we got activation URL. So I'm gonna copy this one. So this is gonna be the URL for when someone needs to activate their account, which will be activation slash the UID slash the token. Then we got the user create password retype. So this means do we wanna have a re-password field when someone hits the create user endpoint? So I do want someone to confirm their password, so I will set this one to true because by default it's false. And then the next one, set username retype. So this is if you're setting a different username, which in our case would be a different email. I'm not gonna include this. We have set password retype. Now I'm also not gonna have setting a password. We're, we are gonna have resetting a password, but setting a password, this is in particular if you're logged in, and let's say you wanna set a different password, then this is what you would use. And then this pretty much means you have to confirm the password that you're trying to set. So then you'd have to include this renew password field. I'm just gonna set this to false since I'm not gonna have that functionality in this app. And then I'm gonna have password reset confirm retype. So this one I will have. So this will require the renew password. And that's when I'm hitting this endpoint here. And that's gonna be when I'm resetting a password. So when we're resetting a password, what we do is we hit an endpoint, which is going to send us a reset password link. And then we're gonna to go to that. And then we're gonna to have to put in our new password. And then I don't wanna just have one field where I just set the new password. I also wanna have a user have to confirm that new password. So I'm gonna copy this, and I'm gonna set that to true. And then going back, we have username reset confirm retype, so I don't have username resetting, so I'll leave that as false. Log out on password change, that will be false. And then password reset show email not found. So this is gonna be when we're requesting to reset our password, we're gonna put in our email and then we get the link. Now this will make it so that if your email, it doesn't exist in the database, then we're gonna get a 400 bad request. That's if you set this to true. But I'm gonna leave this as false, and in particular it's because of what it explains here. So if you set this to true, it will expose information of whether an email is registered in the system. So I don't really want that, so I'm just gonna leave it as false. So this will always succeed. So you're always gonna get a 204 no content response, even if the email doesn't exist and you don't receive that email. And I'm okay with that, just so that it doesn't reveal that this email exists in the system. And then we have username reset show email not found. This also false since we don't have username resetting. And then we got token model. So points to which token model should be used for authentication. In case of only stateless tokens, like JWTs are used in the project, this should be none. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that since we are using JWTs. So token model, that will be none. So there we go, those are the Joser settings. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna run this. I'm gonna do python manage.py run server localhost 8000. And this way I can just see if I made any typos. So I didn't make any typos. Now there's gonna be these unapplied migrations. I'm not gonna make these migrations yet and that's because I wanna set up the custom user model first, make those migrations, and then I will migrate. So I'm gonna stop running this. I just wanted to see 
if any typos are made so far. It seems like there weren't. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scroll up. I'm gonna go to my installed apps. I'm gonna include my users app because I will need this here. And then I'm gonna start working on that custom user model. I'm gonna open this up, open up the models, and this is where I'm gonna work from. So to help me out with this process, so I have the Django documentation open, and I'm gonna search for authentication. And then there's this right here, which is for customizing authentication in Django. And then inside of here, at the bottom, there's a full example of setting up a custom user model. So there's a section here, it says a full example. I'm gonna do something very similar to what this shows here. So to help me out, I'm just gonna copy this. I'm gonna copy everything here. I'm just gonna paste it inside of here. Now there are gonna be things I don't need. So all of these things I don't need, so I'm just gonna delete them. And then string representation of this model, I'll keep it as email. And then username field is gonna be email. I'm gonna be using single quotes. And then I'm gonna have required fields. So the username field is what I'm gonna be logging in with by default. And then required fields are any additional fields I need to create my account. So I'm gonna have here first name and last name. So when I'm registering, I want these to be supplied as well. And then this date of birth field, I don't want here. So I have this email field. I'm just gonna get rid of this verbose name. Unique, true, I'll have showing up first. I'm just gonna reformat this a bit. And then because we have first name, last name, we have to define those. So I'm gonna have first name, that'll be models.char field, and it'll have a max length of 255, let's say. I'm gonna copy down the line and have the last name as well. And then I'm also going to rename this so I'm going to call this user account. And then I'm also going to have my objects. It's going to be user account manager. So I'm going to copy this and change the name of this. So it's going to be user account manager. So this thing is inheriting base user manager. And pretty much what this thing is, is in Django. If let's say we have our user model, which is user, then we can do things like dot objects dot create user. So that is what this objects thing is. It gives us access to things like create user and let's say filter and get. So all of those things are included inside of this manager. Now in particular, we have this create user, which I wanna set up inside of here. And this is going to overwrite the behavior of creating a user because now I'm gonna be using an email. And then we have this state of birth field, which I don't want here. We have the password, which by default is none. So if this isn't supplied, then the creation isn't going to work. And then I'm also gonna have keyword arguments here. So this is going to be a dictionary, and then it's gonna include things like our first name and last name. So that's gonna be our extra arguments. Now you can also, let's say, do first name and last name here, but I like doing it this way more, so I'm just gonna Keep it like this. And then if we don't have an email, we're gonna raise a value error. And then here's where we create our user model. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do email is equal to self.normalize email. So what normalize email does is if you have something like John Doe at example.com, normalizing is going to set this part to be like lowercase. So I will end up with example.com. Now one thing to note with normalizing an email, it only normalizes what's after the at, doesn't normalize what's to the left of it. So if I have John Doe, and I put this through the normalize email, nothing will change. So what I wanna do is email is equal to email.lower. And then that way it'll just set everything to lowercase and that way I would end up with something like John Doe at example.com. Because if someone, let's say, 
have their cap locks on or something and did John Doe at example.com. The next time they go to sign in, if they use lowercase, they're not gonna be able to log in. So that's why I'm gonna have this email.lower. And then here I'm gonna have email is equal to email. And then I'm gonna have keyword arguments. And then after that, we're gonna do user.set password of password. So this is going to hash the password. Then we're gonna save the user and we're gonna return the user. And then Joser behind the scenes is gonna be using the create user of our custom user model now. Now I also want the ability to create a super user. And then I will want another import. And then that one is gonna be my permissions mixin. And this is something I'm gonna have my user account inherit. So I'm gonna place it in here and that's gonna give me some additional fields like is staff and is super user and whatnot. So that will come with the permissions mixin. And then instead of using this is admin, I'll be using those fields that come with the permissions mixin. So right now we have this is active and this thing by default is set to true. Now this will be flipped to false with Joser because of the settings that we have with needing to activate the account. So by default, even though this right now is true, it will be false when we create users. Now I will keep this default as true here. And in particular, this is gonna be for when we're creating a super user. So if I have this default false, when I do my like Python create or Python manage.py create super user, when I go to create that, if I have this as false, my super user is going to have is active as false. And then I won't be able to log in with my super user. I'd have to go into the database itself and adjust this to be true, just so I can log into my admin panel. So because of that, I'm going to have this default be true. And then instead of is admin, I'm going to have is staff. This by default is going to be false. Then I'm also going to have is super user. This will also by default be false. So is staff, this lets us log into the Django admin panel. And then is super user, just gives us a super user permission. So this right here is what actually gives us the ability to let's say go into the admin panel and edit things. So the next thing I'm gonna do is go to this create super user. I'm just gonna get rid of this doc string. And then this has date of birth inside of here. I don't want date of birth. I want keyword arguments. And then this behind the scenes is just gonna do self.createUser, which is literally this function here. So we're gonna pass the email, password, and keyword arguments to this thing, and it's gonna create a user, and it's gonna return that user. So then here, the main difference is I'm gonna have keyword args. So we're gonna get that user, which gets returned. So the next thing we wanna do is we just wanna set those properties. So is staff we wanna to set to true, and also is super user we wanna to set to true, and then we wanna save that. And that's pretty much it. That is now gonna be a super user because they have these two flags set to true. So there we go. That is our custom user model created. So it wasn't too bad, but now we have to set this to be used. So the way we do that is there's a setting and inside of here, if you scroll down, you'll see this auth user model. You just have to supply the path to it. So that's the last thing we have to do and our custom user models in place and we can make our migrations. I'm gonna go back to my project, open up my settings.py, scroll to the bottom. And then this will just be equal to users. That's the name of our app and then user account. All right, so now we're in a pretty good spot. So the next thing I can do it's Python manage.py make migrations. There we go. And Python manage.py migrate. And that will migrate to my SQLite database. And now we can just have our server running. So I'll do manage.py run server localhost 8000. And then I'm just gonna have this running so that if I ever make a typo, I can just very quickly catch it. So this is something I like to do. So I'll close that. And then with what we have here, we're actually already set to test things out. Now we didn't set up course headers yet. I'm gonna do that afterwards. It's not really important. The course headers are more for the client. 
and that will set up some headers in the responses, which then will allow for cross-origin requests. Although if we're using something like Postman, we're not in a browser environment, so cores doesn't really come into play. So cores is more of a browser thing. So that's just something to note. Now we will have to have that set up, but to test out what we have right now, we don't have to quite do that yet. Now that is something that we did install, but we're gonna get to setting that up after just testing what we have. So let's go ahead and see what we got. I have Postman open. So you're gonna wanna do the same if you wanna test out the API. I'm gonna create a new collection. And then I'm gonna call this full auth. And of course I made a typo. Uh, where's my renaming? There it is. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna put anything that I wanna test out. And actually, something I have to do before I can even test this out is set up my email settings. So that's something I actually didn't do yet. So actually, so we can't test out quite yet. Now, when it comes to sending emails, there's different approaches that you can take. And the approach that I'm gonna take in this app is by using an AWS service. So this service is gonna be the AWS SES service, and that is a service made for sending emails. So that is what I'm gonna be using in this project. Now there are other options. You can use things like SendGrid or other options as well. But in my case, this is the approach I'm gonna take. So I'm gonna open things up. I'm gonna stop running this. And I'm gonna do a pip install for Django-SES. -S. So that's gonna install that package for me. So I'm gonna clear. I'm gonna do a pip freeze requirements txt. So anytime I install new dependencies, I want to do this just so I can put that inside of the requirements txt. I'm going to clear this up now. And I'm going to rerun my server. So let's set this up. So we're not going to do a test quite yet, but we're almost there. And this right here is the documentation for Django SES. So I'm gonna have links to everything I'm using in the description so that we don't have to look at this URL and try to type it yourself. It'll all be in there. And then to set this up, first thing we have to do is install, which we did. And then you're also gonna wanna have this in your installed apps, but it doesn't seem like they're showing that here. Ah, there it is. So sending, oh, that's for sending stats. So actually we don't wanna be sending stats, so we don't have to include this in our installed app, so that's fine. What we will need is the other settings. So I'm gonna scroll up and find this stuff here. So first of all, we wanna set email backend to be this. So for my email settings, I'm gonna find a spot for that. Maybe below the databases, I'll have my email settings. So email backend will be this right here. And then you're also gonna have to set up your AWS access key ID and secret key. Now, one thing I'm gonna be doing in this project is I'm gonna be using DigitalOcean Spaces, which is very similar to AWS S3 buckets. And then that is also gonna have an access and secret key. So one thing that SES allows you to do is alternatively set up these settings. So AWS SES access key ID and also the secret key. And then that way I can have these credentials separated. So the one for the digital ocean spaces, it's gonna be these ones here. And the ones for SES will be these ones here. And then behind the scenes, they're also using the Python Bodo 3 package to do this communication. So that's actually something you would see inside of the requirements TXT. Behind the scenes, Bodo 3 got installed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this. Then I'm gonna paste it here. I'm also gonna grab this, paste it here, just so that I have these values. And then also I'm gonna do this use SCSV2. So that's if you wanna use the SCS version two client. So might as well do that. So I'll also put that as well. I'm gonna set that to true. 
So these we're gonna set up in a bit. I'm just gonna leave them like, actually I'll just put empty string for now so it doesn't complain. And then we're gonna have AWS SES region name. That's something we're gonna need. So I'll put that here. And we're also gonna need the SES region endpoint. And then for the region endpoint, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna grab this right here and then paste it in here. And then this is going to be using the region name. So what I can do is inside of here, I can just have the region name and I can make this an F string. So that way that can get plugged in there. So now we're gonna have email dot whatever our region is dot Amazon AWS.com. It's gonna set that up. And then another thing we're gonna need. So if we search in here, there's AWS SES from email. So this is an optional option. So the email address can be used as the from address for the email. And that will be this setting here. So I'll put that say over here. And now I'm gonna start making use of the environment variables. So I'm gonna do get env. I'm just gonna set this to be this. And there is actually one more setting we're gonna need. And it doesn't show it in that documentation, but this is also more particular with Joser. So if we go into Joser, and then we take a look at email, so let's say if we're sending an activation email. Behind the scenes, this is inheriting base email message. And then if we go through this, we have context getting set up, but we also have the send. Now this send, it's going to set up the from email and it's gonna do it using settings.default from email. So it's gonna be looking for the setting and that's gonna be the from email when Joser is sending emails. So we actually have to set this up. So I just copied that setting. I'm gonna go back into here. I'm just gonna paste that. And I'm gonna use an environment variable for this. And it's gonna be the exact same as this AWS SCS from email. So we're gonna use the exact same value. And then for the access key, I'm gonna have get env. I'm just gonna copy this and paste it here and here as well. So for this, it's gonna be AWS SES access key ID. This environment variable is gonna be the secret key. Then I'm gonna have region name. And there we go. These are all the email settings. So now I'm gonna open up my env file. I'm just gonna start pasting these in there. So I'm gonna have the access key. And have the secret access key. And have the region name. And then region endpoint we don't need to do. And then finally we have this AWS SES from email, which both this setting and this setting will use. I'm gonna copy that and paste it in here. All right, so now we have to set this up. So right now I have two emails set up so that I can test things out in this project. So I have this John Doe 1357933 email address. So this is going to be my sender email. Then I also have a receiver address and that's gonna be this John Doe 1357915 at gmail.com. So this is gonna be using to like register and log in with an account on my application. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into aws.amazon.com. So you will have to create an AWS account if you don't have one. Then after that, you can sign in. Now in my particular case, I set up an IAM user and that's what I'm logging in with. So then I can put in the account ID. This is my account ID, the IAM user I set up and the password. Now you can also log in with a root account. That's also perfectly fine. And by default, that's gonna be your login screen. And then once you have your root user, you can set up 
an admin user. I'll also show that setup that I have. So for now, just because I have this IAM user, I'm gonna log in with it instead of with the root. And then if you go into IAM, which you can also search for, so that's this service. So the setup that I have, so if you're logging in with a root user, the way that you can do this is you just go under this users, and then you can just add a user. And in my case, I made a user with the username of admin. And then this thing has a policy of administrator access. And this thing just gives me administrative access for this particular user. Now, in the case of this particular admin user, I attach permissions directly of the administrative access. Another thing you can do is you can also make user groups. So let's say I can have like an admins user group. And then this thing here can have permissions of like administrator access and billing. And then you can just have your user be part of the group. In this case, I just have him as none. And he just has the permissions of administrative access. So that's that part. The next thing you have to do is go into SES, which is Amazon Simple Email Service. And then also you wanna note the region. So right now I'm in CA Central 1, so that's my region. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy that from the URL, just so I don't make a typo. Then inside of the region name, I'm gonna paste that in here. So CA Central 1. And then for the from email, that's gonna be my John Doe 1357933 at gmail.com. So that's my sender email. And now I need to set up these two things. So inside of here, what you need to do is you need to go into verified identities and you need to verify both the sender and the receiver email. You can't just have the sender, you need both. So I'm just gonna go to create identity, email address. I'm gonna put in John Doe, 1357933 at gmail.com and I can create that identity. And I'm gonna do that one more time. So back in here, so this right now has verification pending. We're gonna to get to that. So I'm gonna create another email address. And this is gonna be my receiver email. So you need to include both or this is not gonna work. So right now both of these are pending verification. So if I go into here, so this is my John Doe, 1357915 email. So this got an email and that has a link which I can now click and there you go, verified. And I have to do the same thing with my other email address of John Doe 1357933 at gmail.com. So here's that link, click it to verify and there we go. That's all you gotta do to verify. So back in my AWS console, if I refresh, these should now both be verified, beautiful. So the next thing you have to do is go into my SMTP settings and create SMTP credentials. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So we have IAM username. We can show more information if we want. So this is some stuff it has configured. So I can just create this user. And this user, it's gonna have credentials which I'm gonna be using and it's gonna be responsible for sending these emails. So now I can show these credentials. Now, one thing that I found is whenever you create this, for some reason, the credentials it gives you off the bat don't work and I have to recreate them. So I'm just gonna close and I'm gonna go through that process just to make sure that it works. So under now IAM users, so we are now in IAM. So right now we have this user created. So I'm gonna click on this user go to security credentials and I'm just gonna remove the credentials it has right now. And then you have to deactivate the key before you can delete it. So I'll deactivate, paste this in and delete. And I'm gonna create a new access key. So it's gonna be for local code and you have to check this thing. And then you can set up tags. I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna create the access key. And now I can grab these values. So I can put the access key here. Go back here, 
copy this and paste in my secret key. So I have both of these set up. So now I have all of my settings so that emails work. And now I'm just gonna click on done and continue. So I already have the secret key copied. So if you click continue, you won't be able to see this anymore. So make sure that you set up those environment variables. Otherwise you're gonna have to recreate these. So there we are. And then the next thing I'm gonna have to do as well is go into permissions. So right now we have this permission of Amazon SES sending access, which just gives you an allow action of SES send raw email. But I will need another permission to have sending emails work. So I'm just gonna do that now. I'm gonna go add permissions, and then I'm gonna use attach policies directly. I'm just gonna search for SES. Now I don't need SES full access. What I do need is, I I think it's, yeah, read only access because I do need this get access and that I get with this policy. So I'm just gonna attach that one. So click next, add permissions. And now we have this as well. So with that, we are now all set up with SES. So now we can test out our backend API. So I'm gonna now open up Postman once again and let's test these endpoints out. So the first thing I would wanna do is create a user. So let's actually also make sure that our server is running. So it is, and actually I'm gonna restart the server just because I added these environment variables. So I wanna make sure it picks that up. So I'm gonna rerun. And then I can also just close this stuff up. And now let's take a look at the endpoints that we have. So back inside of my Joster settings, or I guess inside of the documentation, you can go to base endpoints. And here is our user create endpoint. So we're gonna be hitting this endpoint here. Now in particular, when we set up our URLs, we prefix this with API slash. So our endpoint we're gonna be hitting is localhost 8000 slash API slash users and then slash. So make sure to have that trailing slash there. That is important. Then these are the things we have to put in here, the username field, required fields. So we define those in our custom user model. So we have username field, that's email, required fields, first name, last name. And then if we get a 201 created, this worked, or 100 bad request means this didn't work. So let's try this out. So localhost 8000 slash API slash users slash. So again, make sure to have that trailing slash there. We're gonna have content type of application slash JSON. And then I'm gonna send some raw data. So I'm gonna have first name, which will be John. Last name, this will be Doe. The email. This will be my John Doe 1357915 five email. So this is my receiver email. I'm gonna have password and I'll do my secure password. And then I also need the re-password. So let's test out what happens if these don't match real quick two password field didn't match. So that means we set things up correctly to have these two get compared. I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna click on send. And there we go. We get a 201 created and we get back our data. So first name, last name, email, and the ID of the user. So perfect. I'm gonna save this now. This will be my create user. And I'm gonna save that in full auth. So now, the next thing I'm gonna do is test out logging in, which should fail right now because our account isn't activated. So I wanna test that behavior. So that endpoint is gonna be localhost 8000 slash API slash JWT slash create slash. Now you can also go into the JWT endpoints and you will see these endpoints here. So we need to pass the username field, which is our email and the password and a 200 okay, 
with an access refresh token means things worked. A 401 unauthorized means things did not work. And then we're also gonna be testing out this refresh endpoint and this verify endpoint as well. So let's go ahead and put in our content type of application JSON and my body, which will have the email. And the password, which is my secure password. So let's send this. So no active account found with the given credentials. So that's what I expected. So now we have to go through the activation process. So back in here, we received that email successfully. So that's really good. Now, another thing that we're gonna notice is here, we have the localhost 8000 team and we also have this domain being used here. Now these are things we're gonna wanna customize. So in particular here, I wanna have something like the my full auth team or something like that. And then here, I'm gonna want localhost 3000 instead of 8000 because my front end application is gonna end up running on localhost 3000. And also when we're in production, we're gonna have our API on a subdomain of api.thedomain.com. And then the front end next JS project is gonna just be on the domain.com. So when I get this link in production, I also don't want it to be like api.mydomain.com slash this activation link. So that's something we're gonna edit. But before we do that, I'm just gonna copy this, actually I'm gonna copy this part here because we have the UID and the token. I'm gonna want those values in order to activate the account. So back inside of here, we're gonna do localhost 8000 slash API slash. It's also gonna be a post request and let's take a look at the endpoint we have to hit. So back in the Joser settings. I'm gonna to go to base endpoints. And here we have user activate. So this will be users slash activation slash with the trailing slash. And we're gonna put in the UID and the token in a post request. So 204 no content means this worked. Anything else means it failed. So users slash activation slash. So content type will be application JSON. And in the body, we're gonna have the UID. So I'm just gonna paste this whole thing and the token. So the token is this part after the slash. So we're gonna cut this, I'm gonna delete that slash, put in the token, and this should be good. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add an extra character just to test out that this works. So there we go, we got the 400 bad request because the token was incorrect. So now if I get rid of that additional character, this should now work. So I'm gonna send this, there we go, 204 no content. So the activation succeeded. So I'm gonna save this, this will be user activation. And now this should work. So I'm gonna try the JWT create once again. And now we get the access and the refresh token in the response body. It's perfect. So we tested out those endpoints. Now let's test out the other JWT endpoints. I'm gonna copy this, paste. So we're gonna have our refresh endpoint. That will be a post request. And if we go into our JWT endpoints, the refresh will just expect in the request, the refresh token, and the response will be a 200 okay with the access token. So let's put in the content type of application JSON. I'm gonna pass raw data with refresh, and that will be the refresh token. So here in the response, we got that refresh token. I'm gonna to copy that, go back here. I'm gonna paste it. I'm gonna add an extra character just to test the non-working behavior. So there we go, token is invalid or expired. Now if I get rid of that, it should now work. There we go, 200 okay with the access token. I'm gonna save this.
There we are. And the last JWT endpoint I will test is the verify endpoint. This will be a post request to API JWT verify. And then here, I'm going to have content type, application, JSON. Then as for the data, what we have to pass is token. And this token will be the access token. If everything works, 200 OK. Otherwise, 401 unauthorized. So let's try this out. So we're going to have token. So this will be the access token. So I'm going to copy my access token. Go back here and paste it. And I'm going to put an extra character just to test out the non-functioning behavior. There we go. Token invalid or expired. If I get rid of the extra character, send. There we go. Now, if it's been over five minutes, then yours might have just gotten as invalid. So if that's the case, just hit this endpoint one more time, grab a new access token, and then you can test out the verify endpoint. Because remember, by default, access tokens expire after five minutes. So I'm going to save that. JWT user verify. So I'm going to close these up. So now going back, the other base endpoints we want to test. So we did user activate. Now we also have retrieving a user. So that's going to be users slash me slash. So localhost 8000 slash API slash user slash me slash. This will get the current user. And this is an authorized route. So if I were to send this as is, it's not going to work. I need the authorization header. That's by default how this works. You're going to have authorization. Then you're going to have bear. So that's the auth header type. And then the access token. So I can copy the access token. And I can paste it after bear. So bear space access token send this, you should now get back the user with the 200 OK. Now this behavior with passing the authorization header, this is something I'm going to overwrite for now, just testing out the default behavior. But we will come back to this that we're not going to need an authorization header. Instead, we're going to have HTTP only cookies, which are going to have our access and refresh tokens. So we'll get to that a little bit later. I'm going to save this as retrieve user. And then next, we've got to user delete. I'm not going to test that one. We have set username, set reset username. So all of these I'm going to skip. Same with set password. So I want to test out reset password. So this one's going to be this endpoint. It's going to be a post request where we pass in the email field. So post request localhost 8000 slash API slash users slash reset underscore password slash. I'm going to have content type application JSON. Then in the body, I'm just going to have email. And I'm going to have John Doe 1357915 at gmail.com. And actually, before I do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit the template settings. Just because that was the one thing I was mentioning before. So I'm going to have to go back to my code. And then in particular, if let's say we go into Joser. So previously, we were looking at this email. And we had things like activation email. Then we also have other things like password reset email. And these things use these templates. So these templates we can find here. We have templates, email, and all of these. So if I open up, let's say, the activation one. What we're going to notice is in the context, we have things like site name. We have things like domain. So somewhere, this context is getting passed. So here we'd have the protocol, like let's say HTTP. 
localhost 8000 and whatever. And same thing here. So HTTP, the domain, which might be localhost 8000 and then slash whatever you have here. So that would be your href and then also you'd have what you display and then also site names. So let's say the full auth team. So how can we edit these? Well, let's take a look. Right here, what we have is this get context data. And this get context data is calling get context data from the parent class. So that is this right here, what we're inheriting. So if I visit this, we have get context data. And then if we take a look, we can see some things getting set up here. So in particular, we have this domain. It's equal to context.getDomain, or you get this domain from your settings. And then protocol, we have it doing it like so. And then we have site name, grabbing it from the settings, site name. And then we have users equal to context.getUser. And then finally, we have context update, where then we update domain and site name, protocol, user, to what we have here. So then in the context itself, this domain that we get from the settings and the site name that we can get from the settings will be inside of the context and they'll be plugged into this template. And same thing for the other templates as well. So knowing that, what we can do, so I'm just gonna close up all this now. So we can now go into our settings and we can set these settings up. So I'm gonna set those up right below here. So I'm gonna have my domain and this I'm just gonna get from an environment variable called domain. And then I'm also gonna have site name. And this I'm just gonna to set to like full auth because this will be the same in both development and production. I'll just have this, and this will be whatever your site name is. And the next thing I will do is go into my env local and then set up the domain. And then the domain in this case, it's just gonna be localhost 3000 because later on that's where our next GS application is going to be running. So now that we have that, I'm going to restart the server. I'm going to clear and do python manage.py run server with localhost 8000. And then back here, now I can send this request off. So tool for no content. Let's see if it worked. There we go, we got the email. And now what we're gonna notice is here, instead of localhost 8000, we have localhost 3000. And then further, once we're in our production environment, we can also set up this domain environment variable and set this up to our domain. So that way this will work in production too. And then we just have the URL. And then here we have the full auth team. So it looks a lot better. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this part. That's our UID and our token. And then also this right here, by the way, it's following what we set up in our settings. So that was for the Joser settings. So right over here, we have password dash reset slash UID slash token. So it's following that scheme for the password reset confirm URL. Now you can also set this to whatever, but this is what I have in my case. You can even have it as like, let's say reset UID token, but you do need the UID and the token in here. So going back now into Postman, we can send off a new request. And let's see what the endpoint here will be. So back inside of Joser, this was reset password. Here we have reset password confirmation. So this is gonna be slash user slash reset password confirm slash we have to pass uid token new password and renew password if it works 204 no content otherwise 400 bad request so let's test that out so slash users slash reset underscore password underscore confirm slash just want to double check that reset password confirm slash good and then we're gonna have our headers of content type, application JSON. I'm gonna pass in raw data, I'm gonna have UID. I'm just gonna paste in that which I copied. So that was just in 
inside of that email, so this part right here. So I'm gonna have UID, I'm gonna have token, and then token, it's gonna, once again, like in the activation email, be this part after the slash. So I'm gonna cut that, I'm gonna delete the slash, I'm gonna paste this in the token part. And then I'm gonna have new underscore password. I'm gonna have my secure password one. And then I'm gonna have re new password, which will be my secure password two. So I'm gonna test when they don't match and see what happens. The two password fields didn't match, perfect. So that is because of this setting right here, password reset confirm retype. So that means that we have to have that confirm field, which is this field right here, and they both have to match. I'm gonna set this to not match. I'm gonna click send, and we get a tool for no content, which means that this worked. So I'm gonna do password reset confirm, save that. I'm also gonna save this one as request password reset. And there we are. So we have all of these. And now if I try to log into this right here using my secure password, now I get a 401 unauthorized because we successfully reset the password to now be my secure password one. So there we go. Now I get the access and the refresh token. So now we tested out all of these endpoints. Now the next step I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna quickly set up these course headers. It's not gonna change anything for us, but it is something we're gonna have to set up. So I'm just gonna delete these two. And then inside of Django course headers, so there it is. These are the things we have to set up. So in our installed apps, I wanna have course headers. So we're gonna go to my installed apps. And I'll put course headers here. You also have to set up middleware for this. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to place this middleware above the common middleware. And then all that this is going to do is it's going to set up some headers that I need to set up when I send responses from my server. And then that way on the browser, I can have these cross origin requests not get blocked by the browser. And then I also have to set up which origins are allowed. So you can do that with cores allowed origins. So I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna go back here and I'll scroll down and put that somewhere at the bottom, maybe below my Joser settings. And then I'm gonna have get env. And it's gonna be the same as this here. And then that way, in production, I'm gonna set up whatever my cores allowed origins are. So that would be my production URL. And I'm also gonna have a default, which is just gonna be HTTP, localhost 3000, and also HTTP, localhost, or sorry, not localhost, but 127.001, colon 3000. And then I can do a dot split on the comma. So that way, when I'm running my Next.js frontend, I can allow cross-origin requests to this right here, which is where Next.js is running. And I'm also gonna format this a bit so it looks better. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm also going to have a cores allow credentials, which is gonna be true. So this right here in my responses is gonna set up a cross-origin allow credentials heading. And then what this is gonna do is it's gonna allow cookies to be getting sent cross domain. So we're gonna need that because when we have different ports that counts as cross domain, so in our development environment, we have localhost 3000 and 8000 for the next JS front end and for the Django backend API. In production, we're also gonna have different domains or cross origins because we're gonna have, let's say our domain.com for our next JS front end and we're gonna have api.mydomain.com for the back end. So this is something we have to include. And then from the front end, when we make Ajax requests, we're gonna include an option called credentials include, and that's gonna allow the cookies to get included in the request. 
And we're gonna need this so that the browser doesn't block the cookies when they're coming back. And so those are things that we have to do in order to manage the cookies. Now we're also gonna have to adjust some other things because there are settings in a cookie that will prevent it from being cross domain even when we have these things. So we're gonna get into that. But this is what we need for now with our course setup. So I'm gonna save that. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to start to override the behavior of Joser and simple JWT. So that way I can get the behavior I want instead of having to put that authorization header inside of my requests. Whenever I wanna make an authorized request, I just want this to be managed by HTTP only cookies. So that pretty much just means cookies that have the HTTP only flag set to true, which just prevents JavaScript on the front end from reading the values of our access and refresh tokens when they're stored in the cookies. So it's just a very secure way to store these cookies. But we also need a way to have our authorization process actually read these values. So to do that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new file inside of my users app. I'm gonna call it authentication.py. And then right now in my settings, my default authentication classes is this right here. So right now it's gonna be a little bit different. So I'm gonna copy this. I'm just gonna paste it here. Because what we're gonna wanna do is from REST Framework Simple JWT Authentication, I'm gonna wanna import JWT Authentication, and I'm gonna wanna override this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a class called custom, whoops, custom JWT Authentication, and that's going to inherit JWT Authentication, and we're going to override its Authenticate method. So we got some auto filling here. So if I click into this and look at authentication, this right now is how it works. It gets the header. If the header is none, we return none. So this in particular is something we're gonna wanna override because we're not gonna have a header, but we're still gonna want this to work because we're gonna wanna get the values from the cookies instead. And then we get the raw token. So because inside of the headers, they have things like bear token. So this will just get the raw token. It'll make sure it's there. It's gonna validate it and it's gonna return. So I'm just gonna copy what's in here. Go back into my authenticate and I'm just gonna paste in here. So we're gonna have self and request. And then I'm just gonna wrap all of this in a try accept just to make sure things work. And if they don't, I'm gonna return none. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get the header. Now, if the header is none, instead of returning none, I'm just gonna get the raw token from the cookies. So the way I can do that is raw token is request.cookies.get, and I'm gonna get an access cookie. So I'm gonna expect there to be a cookie called access and I'm gonna retrieve it. And another thing I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna go into my settings and maybe right over here, I'm gonna set up a setting, which will be auth cookie. I'm gonna set that to be access. And then what I can do is from Django conf import settings. And then instead of doing access hard coded like this, I can do settings dot auth cookie. So it's just a nicer way to do this part. And then I'm gonna have an else. So if header is none, we're gonna get the raw token from the cookies. Otherwise, we're gonna do it like it was doing before using the header. So I'm gonna paste this in the else block. So there we go, pretty easy to override this. And then we're gonna see is raw token none. If it is return none, we're gonna validate it just like before, and we're gonna return. Now the only other thing we have to do is go back to our settings and then go to our authentication classes. We're no longer using this. We're gonna be using our custom one. So custom JWT authentication, which is gonna come from our users app dot authentication dot custom JWT authentication. So now anytime you make an authorized request, we're gonna use the cookies. Right now, our authorized requests, they are going to work because in our authentication file, we are expecting to grab from the cookies, the access token cookie. 
However, we still will have to override some things for the views in order to have these cookies get set and have them set with the appropriate options. And then that way this whole thing is gonna work. So let's go ahead and get started on that. So inside of my users app in the views.py, this is where I'm gonna get started with overriding some of these views. In particular, the views that I need to override are going to be the ones related to JWT authentication. So the create view, refresh view, and verify view. So one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import my settings from Django comp, import settings. And then in my settings, I'm gonna define more settings than just this auth cookie. And then I'm gonna be using those for some settings related to these cookies. So I'm just gonna grab them from here to have them in one place and have these settings just be correct. So that way I'm not like hard coding things across my different views. So it's just a nice way to kind of organize things. So while I'm here, I'm just gonna set these up. So I have my auth cookie already. I'm gonna have auth cookie access max age. And then this I'm gonna set to 60 times five. So that's gonna be 60 seconds times five, which is five minutes. So by default, my JSON web tokens for the access token, they expire after five minutes. So I'm just gonna have this match that. So the cookie is gonna expire after five minutes as well as the access token. I'm just gonna have the synchronization be proper. And then I'm also gonna have a max age for my refresh token. Now this one's gonna be longer. This one's gonna be 24 hours by default. So I'm just gonna match that by doing 60 times 60, which gives me an hour times 24, gives me a day. And then I'm gonna have auth cookie secure. So this is going to set whether we need an SSL certificate or I guess an HTTPS connection in order for these cookies to get sent in the requests and the responses. So in my development environment, I'm gonna want these to be false, but in production, I'm gonna want it to be true that we do need to have a secure connection in order to have these cookies get sent in the requests and the responses. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in get env and I'm gonna get an auth cookie secure environment variable, which we're gonna set up by default. I'm gonna have this be true and then equals true. So that way in the production environment, we don't have to set this thing up. It's just gonna be true by default and true equals true is just gonna give us the Boolean of true. But in my development environment, I'm gonna to wanna to have this thing set up. So I'm just gonna put it here and it's gonna be false. Now, another thing we're gonna need after this is auth cookie HTTP only. So this is gonna set the HTTP only flag on that cookie so that way JavaScript can't access the values in the browser. I'm gonna have the auth cookie path which is just gonna be slash in our case. And then I'm also gonna have auth cookie same site, which I'm gonna to set to none. So for same site, you can either have strict, you can have lax, or you can have none. So strict means that in order for these cookies to get sent, the domains, they have to match. So this will restrict where you can't have these cookies get sent cross origin. So that's what we have strict which means that my front end would have to be on, let's say, mydomain.com, and my back end would also have to be on mydomain.com. They'd have to be on the exact same domain, the exact same ports. So that's if you have strict. Now, in our case, we're gonna have these be cross-origin, and I'm gonna want these cookies to get sent cross-origin. In order for that to happen, I can't have the same site property as strict. Now, I can have lax, but what lax will do is it's going to allow these cookies to get sent cross origin, but only on safe methods. So safe methods are things like your get method, your options method, your head method. So these are your safe methods. But if we have things like post and put and patch and delete and so forth, these cookies won't get sent with lax. So in order for that to happen, to have cross origin cookies getting sent, I need to have none here so that it also works with those other methods because in particular, I will need that to work because even for these views I'm about to override, like my create view, the refresh view, verify view, these views are all post requests. And I'm gonna want these cookies to get sent with those post requests. So I need same site to be set to none. So that's gonna be all the settings I need. 
Hopefully all of these make sense. And then there's also gonna be a domain setting that gets set by default, and that's gonna be the current domain. In our development environment, it's gonna be localhost, and our production environment is gonna be api.thedomain.com. So that domain property, it's gonna make these cookies only valid when they're getting read from here. And here being our API server. So now let's go ahead and go back here. And what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna import those views we need to override. So those are coming from REST framework, simple JWT dot views. And then we have our token obtain pair view. This is for the create. We have the token refresh view. This is for the refresh endpoint. And then we have token verify view. And the verify view, I don't think I explained it, but the verify view just verifies whether our access token is still valid. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a class, which is going to be my custom token obtain pair view. And this thing's gonna inherit token obtain pair view. And then we're gonna to wanna to override its post method. So by default, the way that this is gonna work is it's going to generate the access and refresh token, and it's just gonna send them in the body of the response. But I don't wanna just do that. I also wanna set the access and refresh token in the cookies. So I'm gonna put in self request args and keyword arguments here. And then the way that I can do this is I can just call the super method post, passing in requests, args and keyword args. So this super class is just the token obtained pair view, just like before. I'm gonna capture that response. And then I'm gonna check, was this successful? I can do that with response.statusCode equals 200, because 200 means this was successful. And if that was, then I'm gonna get the access and refresh tokens, and I'm gonna set the cookies. And then after that, I'm just gonna return that response. So before I return the response, I wanna set those cookies, because by default, this token obtained pair view will not do that. So I can get the access token, response data get access is where I get that from. And then we have refresh token, which is response data get refresh. And the next step is just to set these cookies. So I can easily do that with just response dot set cookie. And then in here, I'm gonna have access. That's gonna be the name of my cookie. And then I'm gonna have the value. This is gonna be access token. So that's the access token I got from the response of this token obtained pair view. And then I'm gonna have a couple of those settings. So I'm gonna have max age, which will be settings dot auth cookie access max age. Then after max age, I'm gonna have my path, which will be settings dot auth cookie path. So this is that slash path. I'm gonna have secure will be settings dot auth cookie secure. I'm gonna have the HTTP only flag, which will be settings dot auth cookie HTTP only. I think I named it like that. Yep, HTTP only. And then finally I have the same site, which is gonna be settings dot auth cookie same site. So these are all the settings I need in order for this cross origin sending of these cookies to work with the access token. And then I'm also gonna have response.set cookie for my refresh, which will be my refresh token. And then the settings will all be very similar. So I'm just gonna copy this and paste it. The only setting that's different is the max age. So that one is gonna be auth cookie refresh max age. So that's gonna be that 24 hours instead of the five minutes for the access. And with that, we overwrote this one. So now we just have to do the rest for the refresh and the token verify. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna copy this, I'm gonna scroll down, and I'm gonna create another class, which will be my custom refresh view, or I guess token refresh view. I'm just gonna override the token refresh view. So we're just gonna inherit that and then we're gonna override the post. And then for the refresh view, so remember inside of postman for our refresh. So we receive the refresh in the body. 
and then it's gonna send us back in the response and access token and it's gonna be inside of like JSON data in the response. But instead I wanna have that access token get set inside of the cookies. So going back to the code, what I can do is I can grab the refresh token from the request. And in this case, we're gonna have this refresh token be present in our cookies. So what I can do, instead of grabbing it from like the body data, I can grab it from cookies. So I can do cookies.get refresh. And then if we have a refresh token, then we're gonna set request.data refresh to be the refresh token. And then we're gonna call the token refresh views post request. And then we're gonna have this inside of the data. So we're gonna grab it from our cookies, put it in the data, and then send the request off. So response will be the super class, post request args and keyword args. Then once we have that, we're gonna check is the response status code 200. That means it was successful. And eventually we're gonna return the response. But before we do, we wanna set our access token. So we're gonna get the access token value. So the new value after hitting this, and that's gonna come from response data get access. And then from there, we can just do our response set cookie. And that'll look pretty much the exact same as this right here. I'm just gonna copy this and paste it here. And there we go. Now we don't have to do anything with the refresh token. Now there are settings you can set in simple JWT. So when you hit your refresh endpoint, you get back a new access token and a refresh token. So this in particular has to do with rotating tokens. So that's one of those settings there. And then if you do that, then you could also get back your new refresh token and set a new refresh token, but I didn't set that setting. So this is the way I'm handling it. And then the last thing I have to do is the verify view. So we're gonna grab this verify view. I'm gonna have a class for custom verify view or token verify view. It's gonna inherit the token verify view. It's gonna be a post request with self request args and keyword args. And then this right here, we are going to send this request to the token verify view with that token piece of data in the request. And then we're gonna get the response, which is just gonna be like a 204, no content if it was successful. So that's gonna be what checks whether the access token is verified or not, which means that we are still logged in. So what I can do is I can grab access token from my request cookies access. And then if I have an access token, then inside of the request data token, I'm gonna to place that access token. And then all we have to do is return calling the super classes post passing in request args and keyword args. So if we have this, we're gonna put the access token inside of token, just like we did when we were testing this out. In the body, we had this token. So now we're just grabbing the value from the cookies, placing it in the request body, and we're just sending the request off to the token verified view. And that's how we deal with having these cookies. So now we have these, we're also gonna have to set up URLs and instead of using the Joser URLs JWT, we're gonna use our custom ones, but there is one more thing we have to do, and that is create a logout view. So when you deal with JSON Web Token authentication, the notion of logging out is more just like you get rid of your access token. Your access token is what you use to make authorized requests. And then if you store it somewhere and you just delete it, now you no longer have that token. So you can't, let's say, make authorized requests. So you're not logged in. So that's kind of the way that this works. Now, right now we're dealing with cookies. So one good way that we can deal with logging out is that our storage mechanism is that we have an access refresh token in our cookies and we just have to delete these cookies. So what I'm gonna do to do that is I'm gonna create a logout view 
This is gonna inherit API view, which I need to import. So I'll do that say here. So from rest framework.views, I'm gonna import the API view. I'm also gonna need a couple other imports. So from rest framework dot response, I'm gonna need response. And also from rest framework, I'm gonna need status. It's gonna be for setting status codes in the response. So I'm gonna scroll down. And then this is gonna be a post request. We're gonna to have to be authorized in order to hit this route. And it's just gonna delete our access and refresh token. I'm gonna to pass in self request args and keyword args. And then response, it's just gonna be response. And we're gonna have a status of status.htp. 204, no content. And then we're just gonna do response.delete cookie. We're gonna delete access. We're also gonna delete the refresh cookie. So this is how we do this in Python with Django. And then we're just gonna return that response with our cookies being deleted. And there we go. So now the next step is gonna be inside of users to create our urls.py file and create URLs for these custom views we created. I'm just gonna close up some of these other files I'm not using right now. So first thing I'm gonna do is from my views, I'm gonna import these views I made. So my custom token obtain pair view, custom token refresh view, custom token verify view, and my logout view. I'm gonna make my URL patterns. It's gonna be my list. And then here, I'm gonna have my different paths. So in the root, I'm gonna have API slash, and then I'm gonna have here, JWT slash create slash. So it's gonna be the exact same endpoints, only difference is we're gonna use our custom views. And then another thing I have to do is import path. So from Django URLs, that's where I'm gonna import that. And then I can grab this view, paste it, and do dot as view because this is a class based view, so I have to chain on dot as view. Then I'm just going to copy down a couple times because I'm also going to have JWT refresh, which is going to use the custom refresh view, and I'm also going to have verify. That's going to use the token verify view. And then this has to have an, or where is this? Verify. There we go. Make sure that's spelled right. And the last thing I'm gonna need is my logout. So I'm just gonna do logout slash. So it's gonna be with the trailing slash. And this should be logout view. And then logout view dot as view. So there we are. We have our URLs. The only thing we have to do now is go into our project URLs. And instead of using Joser URLs JWT now for our JWT endpoints, we're instead going to use our users URLs. So this is our users app, the URLs we just defined. And there we go. So the last thing to do now is test out that this works. So just to be sure, since I added some settings, I'm just going to rerun my backend server. Then I'm gonna to go to Postman and I'm gonna test this out. So first of all, I'm gonna hit this create. So currently we don't have any cookies. Now if I send this off, we should have two cookies. So in our response, we got the two cookies. And then we have all the settings that we set. We have the domain default to localhost. So that's good. And then in here, we also now have an access and a refresh token. So now with the retrieve user view, previously we were using the authorization header and we can still use the authorization header. Although I can also not have it send this request and there we go. We get back our user. So this still works even without the authorization header now. And this is gonna make things much easier for us because now we can have these credentials be secured in an HTTP only cookie where the front end, it cannot read the values of those values with JavaScript, but we're also gonna have these automatically be getting sent in our requests from the front end, and we're gonna be able to use them to authorize any endpoint that requires authorization. 
So now in particular, the way this is gonna change some things is here, we're still gonna get back this data. Now we can override this to not do that, but might as well also have the default behavior working as well. So you can use things just like you used before with simple GWT, but you also have this added functionality of the HTTP only cookies storing the credentials. Then in refresh, how this is gonna change some things, previously we needed to do this, we needed to have content type application JSON with the refresh, but now we no longer need this. I can just delete this and I can delete the content type application JSON, save that and I can send this and it'll still work. I'll have the access token. Then in my cookies, I'm gonna get the brand new access token and it's gonna get set here. And same with verify. Previously, I needed this in the body and I needed the content type application JSON. I no longer need that. I can just send this off and there we go. 200 okay, this was verified. So our endpoints work. Then the other thing we can now test out is also our logout. So we have a post request, localhost 8000 slash API slash logout slash. It's gonna have the trailing slash. This will be my logout or maybe user logout. And I can send this off. So I get a 204 no content and my cookies are now gone which means that if I go to retrieve my user, I'm now unauthorized. And then of course we can go create our user again. There we go. Access refresh token are here again. And now retrieving the user will work. So there we are. We've now successfully overwritten the behavior so that we can have these credentials stored in HTTP only cookies. Now just one final thing to do for this backend and we're gonna be all wrapped up. Well, actually not just one thing, because one thing we will have to do is set up the OAuth with Google and Facebook, but we're also gonna have to go back and set up our static settings to use digital ocean spaces, and we're gonna have to deploy this back. And so a couple more things, but we're almost there. Okay, so let's get started with setting up OAuth in this project. So first thing I'll have to do is go into my settings, and then inside of my installed apps, there is something else I will need, which is gonna be social Django. I'm gonna save that. Now, when I put this here, there are gonna be additional migrations I'll have to make. And I guess in particular, I'm gonna to have to migrate. I'm gonna stop running this. I'm gonna do a Python manage.py migrate. And that will migrate things from social Django to my SQLite database. And after that, I can rerun. And then after that, we're gonna have some settings we're gonna have to set. So I'm gonna scroll down and say right above REST framework, I'll put authentication backends, which will be a list. And this is where I'm gonna set up the backends. Now we're gonna have one in here, which is going to be Django contrib auth backends model backend. So this one here is going to make sure that our default behavior we have right now works. That's gonna be one of our backends, but we're gonna have additional ones as well for the OAuth. So the OAuth ones are gonna go above here. I'm gonna have social core dot backends dot Google dot Google OAuth2. And then we're also gonna have social core backends, Facebook, and then Facebook OAuth2. So that's gonna set up these two as well. And then those you can even find inside of your virtual environment because we have social core in here. And then we have backends. And then we have things like Google, which is right here and Facebook, which is right here. So the base Google OAuth 2, which is this one here, that's the one that we set up as one of our authentication backends. And then Facebook OAuth 2 was the other one. So that's where these are coming from, just so that you understand how these paths work. And then the other thing we have to set up is with Joser. 
So if I go back to the documentation for Joser, just right here, we have social endpoints. And then to set these up, you're gonna go into your URL patterns and then you're gonna include Joser's social URLs. But the thing is with these social URLs, it's kind of similar to what we had with the JWT, where when we get a response, we're gonna get back the access and refresh tokens except those are going to be in the response data. I also want these to be stored in the cookies. So I actually will have to override the view that handles this social authentication. And then part of my user's URLs, I'm going to have an endpoint, which is going to do this like O slash provider stuff. And then if we look here, we're going to have two different kinds of requests that we make to have the social authentication working. We're gonna have a get request, which is gonna give us a redirect URI, which we can visit. And then once we visit it, we're gonna do things like log into our Google account or log into our Facebook account. And then we're gonna get redirected somewhere. And then for where we get redirected, we're gonna set that up. That's gonna be one of our Joser settings we set up. And we're gonna get a code and a state. And then we're going to pass those in a post request. And that is what's going to actually do our user creation and get us our access and refresh tokens. And then these also aren't gonna be application JSON. Right here it actually specifies we're gonna have application and then this XWWW form URL encoded format. So they're gonna be inside of the URL itself. So we're gonna get to that. But before that, I'm gonna go to my settings. And then here we have the auth token strategy. So that is right here. By default, it's using this right here, which is the JWT token strategy. So that's actually what I want. So I'm not going to touch that setting. I'm just going to use the default. The other thing we need is social auth allowed redirect URIs. So by default, it's empty. This is where we set where we're allowed to redirect to, which is going to be our front end app. So in development, it's going to be localhost 3000 slash some endpoint that we're going to expect to hit, which is going to make that post request. And then in production, it's going to be our domain.com slash whatever that endpoint is. So I'm gonna go back to my Joser settings. I'm gonna add this setting in here. And then this setting, the way I'm gonna handle it is I'm gonna get an environment variable called redirect URLs. And then I'm just gonna do a split with comma. Similar strategy to what we were doing before because the setting will be an array and this will just be a comma separated list. And then also just so that in my development environment, I don't have to set this up. Actually, maybe I will just have this in my development environment. Yeah, that's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna have redirect URLs. That's gonna be my environment variable. Then inside of here, it's gonna be my comma separated list. So I'm gonna have HTTP local host colon 3000 because that's where next GS will be running. And then I'm gonna have slash auth slash Google and then comma, I'm just gonna copy this and paste it here and have Facebook. So then we're gonna grab these values. We're gonna split them into an array and that's gonna be our redirect URLs that we're allowed to redirect to. So I'm gonna expect Next.js to have this route and this route, and then this route, it's gonna handle the post request for Google OAuth, and this one's gonna handle the post request for Facebook OAuth. And also here, I noticed I put an extra O. <laughs> Let's try not to do that. So Facebook, there we go. So this is all set up now. And then because I set up some environment variables, I'm just gonna rerun. Also seems that we have an error on split. And in particular, that's because we got a none type that we're trying to split on. So that's not gonna work. So once I rerun, we're actually gonna have a string value and we're gonna be able to do that split. So that's all gonna work now. And close that up. And then after this, we're gonna have some other settings we're gonna have to set. So I'm gonna set those maybe right here. So one we're gonna have is social auth Google OAuth to key. 
We're gonna get this from an environment variable, which is just gonna be, say, Google OAuth2 key, or I'll call it Google Auth key. Then I'm gonna have social auth Google OAuth2 secrets. This will be Google Auth secret key. And then social auth Google OAuth to scope I'm gonna set. This is gonna be a list where I'm gonna have HTTPS www.googleapis.com slash auth slash user info dot email. And I'm gonna copy this down a line because I'm also gonna have profile. And then I'm also gonna have open ID. So these additional scopes are just gonna let me get some additional values that I wouldn't get by default. So getting the email, first name, last name, things like that, I need to set up these scopes for. And then I'm gonna have social auth Google OAuth2 extra data, which is gonna be my first name and my last name. And then after that, I'm gonna have to set up the Facebook settings. So I'm gonna have social auth Facebook key. That's gonna be in an environment variable, Facebook auth key. I'm gonna have social auth Facebook secret. So that's gonna be Facebook auth secret key. And then social auth Facebook scope. I'm gonna have email and then social auth Facebook profile extra params. It's gonna be a dictionary with fields, which are gonna be comma separated, which will be email, first name, and last name. So there we are. And then that way I can also retrieve the email, first name, last name, when I log in with Facebook OAuth 2. So these are gonna be all the settings we need. The next thing is gonna to be to actually get these keys so that I can actually do the OAuth. So that's gonna be our final step, and then we can test this out. So to do this, I won't need the Joser documentation anymore, I believe, or maybe I'll leave it open just so that I can go back here and show this. And then, what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to go to console.cloud.google.com. You're gonna log in with your Google account and then you're gonna create a project. So you can do that by just clicking here, clicking new project. I'm gonna call this full auth and create. You don't need an organization. You can do no organization. I just have this here. And that's gonna go create the project. So we're gonna wait for that to finish. There we are. So after that, you can navigate into the project. So once we see full auth here, we know we're in the project. And then we're gonna to go to APIs and services and credentials. And this is where you set up your OAuth login credentials. So that's gonna be right over here. Now, before we do that, I'm gonna do this consent screen since I'm getting this popping up. So configure consent screen. And here for user type, it's gonna be external. So I want users outside of my app to log into my app using their Google account. So that's gonna be this. My app name will be full auth. I'm gonna have my support email. And then these settings you don't have to set up. You can have authorized domains which we can get back to later. And then developer contact email. Then I'm gonna save and continue. After that, I'm gonna add some scopes. So that's gonna be these three scopes here. And I'm gonna update so that they're present. And then save and continue. And then you can add test users if you want. So I'm gonna add a test user. In my case, I'm gonna have John Doe 1357915 at gmail.com be my test user. I'm gonna add that. So there we are. And then save and continue. 
And here's my summary. I can just go back to the dashboard now. And then when you're ready to deploy, you would just go publish the app. So I'm gonna go back to the credentials now. I'm gonna create credentials and I want OAuth client ID. The application type will just be a web application called full auth. And this is where I have authorized JavaScript origins. So in Joser, when we're doing this get request, we're passing in a redirect URI. Now, this redirect URI, someone can go make a request to slash O slash your provider, pass in some redirect URI that goes to maybe their website. But the thing is, this authorized origins and authorized redirect URIs will prevent this process from working if someone tries to redirect somewhere outside of what you specify here. So this is a security related thing around OAuth. So here I'm gonna put in my authorized JavaScript origins. So here I'm gonna have HTTP colon slash slash localhost 3000 because it's gonna be our next JS app that we're redirecting to. And then for authorized redirect to our eyes, I'm gonna have HTTP localhost 3000 slash auth slash Google. And then later we're gonna come back here once we have our domain, we're also gonna add that in as one of the URIs and also have the redirect URI for the domain. So I'm gonna create that and just click on, actually, I need to copy these. So I'm gonna copy the client ID. And then inside of my ENV local, actually, first I'm just gonna copy these into that ENV. So I'll do that above the redirect. copy the secrets then I'm going to copy the Facebook auth key and then the Facebook auth secrets so now I just have to fill in all of these so back here I'm going to recopy that client ID I'm going to paste it in the Google auth key I'm going to copy the client secrets and I'm gonna paste that here and save. I'm just gonna rerun my server just to make sure that we have those. Because now we're ready to test our Google OAuth. So I'm gonna click OK, that's gonna close that up. And now let's test this out. So I'm gonna open up Postman. And then I'm gonna close up some of these other things. So first of all, we're gonna have our get request. This will be localhost 8000 slash API slash O slash the provider, which in our case will be Google dash O auth two. And then I believe there's a trailing slash. Let's just double check. Yep, there will be a trailing slash. So I'm gonna send that off. And of course, we did not yet set up the URLs. So let's go ahead and set up the URL so that this actually works. And before we set up the URLs, we do have to go into our views and override the default view that's used for this OAuth. So the view that's used for this, we can actually take a look. We can go inside of Joser and then social and then views. And we have this provider auth view. This is gonna be the thing that we override. Now, the only thing that we see in here is a get, but this also does handle a post through the create API view, which is one of the generic views. And then we are gonna want a URL for this. Now we can either set up like we saw in the settings where we use the Joser social URLs to set up those URLs, but we're gonna want our own custom one because we're gonna override this. In particular, we're gonna be overriding the post. So we're gonna send the post request to the parent class, which is just this provider auth view. We're gonna get the access refresh token. Then we're gonna set those in our cookies and send back the response. So that's how this is gonna work. So we're gonna close this up. And then back in our views, I'm gonna import from joser.social.views. We're gonna import that provider auth view. And we're gonna create a custom 
provider auth view, which is going to inherit this one. We're going to define a post with self request args and our keyword args. And then we're just going to get a response by calling super.post. So this is just going to do whatever the provider auth view did. We're going to get that response. And then we're going to check if the response.status code is 201. So this is just for the post. We're not overriding the get, we're just overriding the post. And then we're going to eventually return this response. But first, we want to set the access and refresh tokens. So access token will be coming from response data get access. And then refresh token will be coming from response data get refresh. And then we're going to set the cookies. So we've already done this inside of our custom token obtained pair view. I'm just going to copy this part, go back up and paste it here. So we're going to set the access refresh token in our cookies, send back the response, and then we're going to have access to them in our cookies. So it's as easy as that. And the last thing we have to do is just go into our URLs. And then from there, I'm going to import this custom provider auth view. I'm also going to import a regular expression path. And then this path is going to be set up like this. So I'm going to have a regular expression, which is going to be a hat and then O slash. And then I'm going to have in brackets, question mark P provider, and then backslash capital S plus, and then slash dollar sign. So this is going to be O slash a provider slash, and then this provider will be things like Google OAuth 2, Facebook, and so on and so forth. So it's just going to handle all of those. We're going to use our custom provider auth view, do a dot as view. And then we're going to have our name of provider auth. And there we go. We now have that URL set up. So now I'm just going to rerun the server and test this out. So back inside of here, let's retry this again. Redirect URI must be set. So let's set up the redirect URI. That's going to be HTTP localhost 3000 slash auth slash Google. So let's send this. And there we go. We get the authorization URL. So this is going to be the Google OAuth to get, or maybe I'll do get authorization URL. And I'll save that. And then I'm going to copy this URL and then back inside of my browser, I'm going to paste. And then the account that I'm going to log in with is my John to one, three, five, seven, nine, one, five account. So I'm going to click that and I'm going to get redirected back. Now we're going to end up seeing this because we don't have a Next.js app running right now, but we did successfully get redirected to localhost 3000 where that's going to be running. We got redirected to this path, auth Google, which our Next.js app will eventually handle. And then it's going to have this state and code inside of the URL parameters. So we're going to grab those and then make the post request. That's how that's going to work. So I'm just going to copy everything here inside of these query params. And then I can close this up. I don't need it anymore. And then we can test out that post request. So the post request is going to go to localhost 8000 slash API slash O slash the provider of Google OAuth 2 slash. And now remember, we're going to have the content type not of application JSON. Instead, we're going to have content type of application slash X www form URL encoded. So then Inside of here, I can have question mark and then this. And we have some extra stuff here. So we have the state as a query parameter and we have the code, which is right here. And its value ends right here. And we have all this extra stuff that we don't need. So I'm just going to delete that. 
And then inside of our params, we can see both our state and code here. And then one thing that we need in order for this to work is we need the state to be present in a cookie because it's going to take that value and compare it. So I'm gonna go open up my cookies. I'm gonna add a cookie for state and paste it here. Now I'm just gonna save. And there we are. So it is not enough to just have this state inside of your query params. You also need to have it in a cookie. And then with that, we can send this request. And there we go, it worked. We got a 201 created, we got an access and a refresh token and user. So now I can even go retrieve the user and this should all work. There we go. We successfully logged in using Google OAuth 2. So I'm just gonna save this. This will be Google OAuth 2 login. So now the only other thing that we have to do is also set this up for Facebook OAuth. So for Facebook OAuth, now I don't need this open anymore. Actually, I will come back to this. <laughs> I will leave it open. So where you're gonna wanna go is developersfacebook.com. So you're gonna want a Facebook account. And then when you go here, you're gonna sign up to this developers Facebook, and then you're gonna be able to log in. And once you log in, so I'm already logged in right now. And in particular, I'm logged in with my John Doe 1357933 at gmail.com email. So that one is John Dallison. And then under my apps, you can create an app. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna set up Facebook login, click next. It's gonna be a website, I'm not building a game. And then you can add your app name, which in my case will be full auth. And then this is my email. So now we've hit the dashboard. So we're gonna now grab those keys that we need. So under settings, basic. Next, I'm gonna grab these two keys. So I'm gonna grab the app ID. I'm gonna flip back to my app, open up my END local, paste in inside of the Facebook auth key, this key. And then I'm gonna show the app secret. I'm gonna copy that, go back and paste that in here for the Facebook auth secret key. So with that, now I can go back for app domains. I'm just gonna add in localhost here. And I'm gonna save that. And then the other thing I have to do is go into use cases. And then here for authentication and account creation, one thing I have to do is go edit this. Then by default, we don't have permission to grab the email. So we have to add that. So there we go. So now that's ready for testing. So I can go back and then we can try things out. So what I'm gonna do is since I added those environment variables in here, I'm just gonna restart the server. I'm gonna flip on back. And then we also have to create a test user. So I'm gonna go under app roles and this is where we can add testers. So I'm gonna open up a Safari window or you can open up Firefox if you're on Windows, doesn't matter. I'm just gonna to navigate to Facebook. So facebook.com, I'm gonna log in with my John Doe 1357915 at gmail.com email. And then I'm gonna to go to the profile. I'm just gonna grab the Facebook ID. So that's this part right here. So in my case, for my account, it's gonna be John Edwards 107. So I'm gonna flip on back here. I'm gonna add a tester. I'm just gonna put in that Facebook ID here. And then submit. So now it's gonna be pending. So if I go back, so inside of my notifications, nothing's gonna show up. So the place where this actually shows up so if you go to developers.facebook.com, so this is now with my other email. So this is John Doe 1357915 at gmail.com. This is the one that I'm requesting so that I can be a tester. And then we're gonna see under my apps, we have a notification. So I can click on that. 
can click on this drop down. Then we have pending app request. And this is where this request is. So full auth, dev mode, I'm gonna accept. And that's how you can be a tester. So now if I were to refresh, that notification's now gone. So I can close out of here, and I can close out of here. So now the next thing I can do is I can come back here. I can do a refresh. I'll see that pending gone. There we go. So now this is a tester for this app. And the next step is going to be to send the request. So I believe everything is in order to test this out now. And then also another thing to note, inside of products, Facebook login settings, right here we have valid OAuth redirect URIs. Now, when we were setting things up for Google OAuth 2, we put in those valid redirect URIs for locos 3000 slash auth slash Google. Now, we don't have to do that here. And in fact, it's going to complain if we do this sort of thing here. And I'll show you exactly why. So this is our redirect URI. I can put that here. I can click Save. And then I'm going to get this little prompt. So localhost redirects are automatically allowed while in development mode only, and you don't need to add them here. So that's pretty much what it's warning me about. So I can just remove it, save, and that'll get rid of that. So by default, localhost is already valid and any endpoint for localhost is good. So we don't actually have to configure anything there. Now in production, we will. We'll have to put like mydomain.com slash auth slash Facebook. But for development, when we're using localhost, we don't have to. So with that, I can now go into Postman. I'm going to copy this, open up a new tab, paste, and this one's going to be for Facebook. So I'm going to put Facebook here, and the redirect URI is going to be like so. So localhost 8000, API, oh, Facebook with the redirect URI of localhost 3000, auth, Facebook. So I'm going to send this. So we get back a response. So I can copy this authorized URL. I'm going to flip back into my Safari window, open up a new tab, and paste this in. And there we go. We get the submit for login review. Some of the permissions below have not been approved for use. So I'm just going to continue as John. And there we go. So now. Of course, we get Safari can't connect to the server because we're on Locos 3000 and we don't have our Next.js app running yet. But we did get redirected to the correct place. This is where Next.js is going to be running and this is where we're going to handle that post request. But what we're interested in is right over here in the query params, we have this code. I'm just going to grab this code and copy everything onwards. So I'm going to copy. I'm going to flip back into Postman. I'm going to open up a new tab. This is going to be a post request. It's going to be localhost 8000 slash API slash O slash Facebook slash. And then I'm going to put a question mark and paste. So here I have two query params, a code and a state that I can see here on the params tab. So now we're good, except again, we need to set that state. So the state cookie, just like how we did when we were doing things with Google OAuth. So I'm gonna copy the state value and go into my cookies. I'm gonna remove the one that's there, add a new one, put in state, put in the value and save. And then the last thing I have to do is go into the headers and put in the correct content type. So content type of application, X, www, form, URL encoded. And with that, we should be good to make this request now. I'm going to send it. And there we are. We got back a response with a 201 created. So Facebook OAuth 2 has worked. And on top of that, now I can go to retrieve user and I can retrieve and we're going to have different details here because this user actually has a different last name. So we're going to see that. So if I send this, now we see the last name of Edwards. So it overwrote what was in there. Now we still have the same ID. So that didn't change but the details are slightly different. So there we go. Now we have Facebook and Google OAuth 2 working. So I'm just gonna save these now. 
So this one's going to be Facebook OAuth2 get authorization URL. And this one's going to be Facebook OAuth2 login. All right, so only one thing left for us to do, and that is to deploy this backend API. And then after we deploy it, we have to test it. Now, before we do that, there are some things that we need to set up first. So in particular, one thing we're gonna have to set up is right up here. Where is it? Right here, our databases. So right now we're using SQLite, but in production, we're gonna be using Postgres. And then another thing we have to do is the static URLs and the media URLs. So this is what we're using during development, but during production, we're gonna use DigitalOcean Spaces. So let's see how we can configure that. Also, I can close out of this now. So I'm gonna open up this here. So this is that guide for DigitalOcean and Django. So there is a section here, and this is for setting up the database in production. So in particular, we're gonna need a package, and it does mention it further up. So right over here, we have DJ database URL. So this is something we're gonna have to install. We're also gonna need this PSYCOPG2 package. So this is a PostgreSQL adapter. And then we also need Gunicorn. And that's gonna be for our web server. So let's go ahead and install these three packages. It's gonna open this up, stop running, and then pip install dj database URL, psycopg2, and also gunicorn. And then there's also going to be one additional thing we need to install. So I'm gonna add another pip install and that's gonna be for Django-storages. So this is what's gonna allow us to set up using DigitalOcean spaces in order to have our static files. So our static files are gonna be stored in there. And with Django storages, you can also very easily configure this to work with AWS S3 as well. But in our case, we're gonna use DigitalOcean spaces. So with that, we have all the packages we need. So I'm just gonna do a pip freeze requirements txt. So that's gonna update our requirements txt to have everything it needs. And we need to make sure that this has everything we need because in production, DigitalOcean app platform is gonna read from that and install our dependencies. And if we're missing one, things are not gonna work. I'm gonna clear, I'm gonna go back. And then something that we also need to do, it was somewhere in here, it has to do with a development mode environment variable that just makes things a little bit easier for us. So right here, so I'm gonna copy this line. And then I'm gonna scroll up. And then right below where I have this .env stuff, this is where I'm gonna paste this in. I'm gonna remove this OS part. So we're gonna get an env called development mode. And then by default, it's gonna be false. So in production, we don't have to set this thing. It's just gonna be false. We're gonna have false equals true, which is gonna be a Boolean of false. But in our development environment, whoops, in our development environment, we're gonna have this thing be true. So true equals true is gonna give us a Boolean of true. So now I can open up my env local. And at the top, I'm gonna to set this equal to true. And I guess I'll put quotes around it since I've been doing that for the other environment variables, although you don't have to. Also, I can do that for this one. It's just more to make it clear that these are gonna be strings. And then with that, I can now scroll down. First thing I'm gonna do is the database configuration. So if I go back, there's gonna be that section on setting that up. So I'm just gonna copy this line here. And then I'm gonna check if development mode is true. If it is, we're gonna do this. And then L if these right here. So if sys argv greater than zero and not equal to collect static. So if we're not doing collect static, then we're gonna do this here. 
which is grabbing the database URL from our environment variables. If that doesn't exist, we're gonna raise an exception. Otherwise, we're gonna set databases equal to this right here. And that's going to configure our default database to be set up in production with Postgres. So this is an easy way to do it. Now you can also do it the same way as you have right here. You don't have to use this package. So I can just set up the engine name, then the user, host, and all that stuff. And then I can have a longer configuration here, or I can just use this, which makes it a little bit easier. So now I'm gonna have to switch some things up here. So I'm just gonna have get env. I'm gonna use single quotes. And then here, I'm also gonna get rid of the OS. Then I have to import this. So at the top, I'm gonna go right here and I'm gonna import DJ database URL. And I'm also gonna import sys since that's something that I need in order to access the arguments. So if I scroll back down, we shouldn't have any other issues here. Although we do since this has to actually be get the NV. And now we shouldn't have any other issues. So with that, our next step is gonna be now the static settings. So we're gonna to wanna to do something pretty similar. So if development mode is true, then we're gonna do this. Otherwise, we're gonna use our production settings. So one thing we're gonna to have to do is go into our installed apps. And then we installed that Django storages package. So then right below, say here, I'll put in storages. So that's gonna be the app name for Django storages. Then I can go back down. And then this is where I'm gonna have all of those settings for Django storages. So let's see what things we have to set up. So one of these is for Django storages. So this one here, and I don't need this anymore. So here we have what we have to do. So we have to install. And then you have Amazon S3. This is where the majority of these settings you're gonna find. We also have DigitalOcean. This is gonna show you the ones you need to set up for DigitalOcean. So the region name as well as the endpoint. But most of the settings we're gonna grab from here. So first of all, this is gonna be for media files. So if we're using Django version that's greater than 4.2, we want this, in our case we are. So I'm gonna grab that, I'm gonna paste that here. So there we go, I'm gonna go back. And then this one's gonna be for static files. Now, in this particular project, this setup of course is a little bit overkill since our only static files we have in our entire project are just the ones for like the admin because we do have that admin panel. But in maybe a more production app where you have a lot of features, then this could be useful. This is more just to show you how to do this more so than it being something that makes sense to have in this project. I'm gonna copy this now. And then below here, I'm gonna paste that, use my single quotes. That's gonna set up my storages. And then I need a couple more settings. So if I scroll down, we have AWS S3 access key ID, as well as the secret access key. So I'm gonna need those two. And then this one's gonna be equal to get env. And I'm just gonna have the exact same name for the environment variable. I'm also gonna want the secret key and I'm gonna paste that, get env. And it's gonna have the same name. And then if we go into the digital ocean settings, we're gonna need this here. So that's the region name. And I'm gonna get that from an environment variable, which is just gonna have the same name. Then I'm gonna need the endpoint. And in this case, it's gonna be an F string. I'm gonna grab this value here. I'm gonna paste it here. It's just gonna be HTTPS colon slash slash. And then here they also put in this dollar sign. You don't want the dollar sign. That shouldn't be there. So we're gonna have the region name, which we're grabbing from here, dot digital ocean spaces dot com. And we'll go back, go into the 
S3 settings. There's a couple other things that we need. So if we scroll down, we have the storage bucket name. That's something we need. So I'll put that right below here. And then something else we're gonna need is the AWS S3 object parameters. So I'll put that say below here. And that's gonna be a dictionary with cache control. And that's gonna have max age equal to 86400. And then 86400 seconds is equivalent to one day. Then I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna grab this AWS default ACL. So by default, this is none. And then options such as public read and private come from here. And then use this to set this to public read. If not, it'll be set to private and we don't want it to be private. We wanna be able to access what's in the storage. So that's gonna be equal to public dash read. And then after that, we're gonna scroll down. We're gonna grab the AWS location. And this is gonna be static. So this is gonna be the file in which we have the static files inside of this bucket. And then there's only one more thing that we need. So if we scroll down, we have this CloudFront section where we have an AWS S3 custom domain that we can set up. Now CloudFront is something specific to AWS, although with DigitalOcean, we can still use the same setting. So this setting is gonna let us set up a custom domain for our CDN. So we can configure a CDN on DigitalOcean spaces, and then a CDN is a content delivery network and it's gonna make fetching any data inside of our DigitalOcean spaces buckets much faster. So that's why we wanna use this. And we don't have to use a custom domain, but we can configure one and it'll just be much nicer to have a custom domain for that. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. So I'll put that setting here and that'll be get env. And I'll have that right here. Now, all of these environment variables we configured here, we don't have to touch those inside of our env local because these are all only for production as well as the database URL settings. So all of these are production only. So we're gonna have to configure those in DigitalOcean's app platform. So with that, we should be officially done with writing code for this project. And now we just have to have a deployment be successful. So that's gonna be our final step. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna deactivate this and I'm gonna do a git init. So I'm gonna set up a git repository in here. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna add quite yet. So I'm gonna to navigate to a site called gitignore.io. I'm gonna type in Django. That's gonna generate a gitignore for a Django project. So I'm gonna copy everything on there using command A and then just command C. And then back in my project, I'll make a .gitignore file. I'm just gonna paste all of that in here and then save. So now this .env.local, that's something I have to add in here. So under the environments, that's just gonna be an additional thing I add. So .env.local, I'm gonna save, and then that should gray that out as well. And then I also wanna gray out this .vs code. So I'll do that at the bottom. And then the last thing I wanna do is add a dot ds store, which is just some file that oftentimes gets added with Mac. So I just don't want this thing to get committed. And with that, we are now good to make our initial commit. So I'm gonna clear, do another git status, see what we have. So you have the git ignore, the project folder, manage.py, requirements.txt, and the users app. So I'm gonna do git add dot, I'm gonna clear, do another git status, and these are gonna be all the files that we add. So we're gonna clear once again, git commit dash M, initial commit will be my message. 
There we are. The Duke gets branch dash A. So right now we have a master branch. And I'm just gonna rename this using git branch dash M main. And then another git branch dash A. And then we can see that this was renamed to main. And that's just because in GitHub, when you create a repository by default, it just has you set it to this. So I'll just do it that way. And then going back, I have GitHub open. And then I'm gonna create a new repository now. I'm gonna call this full-auth-api. It's gonna be public. I'm gonna create it. And then here are the steps, get init. Also, I'm gonna add a readme. And then we need to commit. And then this is that step I just talked about. And then we can add the remote. Before that, I'm just gonna quickly add a readme. And then I'll do full auth API. And then git add dot git commit and add readme. And then I'm gonna do a git remote add origin, just like here, git remote add origin, then you're gonna add your origin. Now in your case, you're probably just gonna do whatever's written here, but in my case, it's gonna be slightly different. So in my case, I'm gonna have git at github.com dash linkweb colon, and then this right here. So linkweb dash full auth API dot git. Now the reason for that is because I manage multiple GitHub accounts. So inside of my home directory, if I go into my dot SSH and do a cat on config. So in particular, when I do git at github.com dash linked web, I'm going to have an SSH key that's linked to that GitHub account. So right here, you can see I have many different repositories. So in my case, this is just how I manage it. So with that, I can click enter. Now in your case, you're just gonna do git at github.com without this part, and then colon, and then the path to your repository. And the last thing I have to do is git push dash u origin main. There we go. And now I can flip back here, do a refresh, and there's our code. So the next thing I'm gonna do is go into DigitalOcean. So if you don't have a DigitalOcean account, you're gonna to wanna to create one. And then one thing that you'll notice, I already have a project, which I called full auth, and I have a domain set up. Now I set this up ahead of time just because it takes time to have things propagate and end up working. So I have a domain in particular on Vercel and it's called linkedwebapptesting.info. It's just what I use for testing when I need a domain. And then inside of here, I set the name servers to be DigitalOcean name servers. So this is how you can get DigitalOcean to manage your domain. So right now Vercel's not managing this. Right now DigitalOcean is managing this because the name servers are set to DigitalOceans. And then if I click into here, I don't really have anything set up other than these NS records, which just have DigitalOcean name servers. So that's where I'm at right now. So if I ended up doing this right now, I'd have to wait like 24 to 48 hours before things get propagated and I can actually use this domain here. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this create and then I'm gonna create first a DigitalOcean spaces. And then I'm gonna set this as the data center and then I'll enable a CDN and then I'm gonna put in the bucket name. I'm gonna call it full auth bucket. And that's gonna be in this project. And I'll create this. So there we go. It's as easy as that to set this up. And then we just have to set up the CDN. We do have the CDN, but I guess what I mean is set up a custom domain for the CDN because it's enabled right now. So I can click on edit CDN settings and then I can add a new subdomain. So I'm gonna click on that. I'm gonna select this here. And then I'm gonna create a new subdomain, which is gonna be spaces.mydomain. 
So it's going to be spaces.linkedwebapptesting.info. So that's going to be my CDN subdomain. And then I'm going to set up a certificate name, which I'm going to call full auth certificates. And then I'll generate that. So there we go. And then next we can also set up cores. So if we go here, click add, we can add an origin that we want cross origin resource sharing. So in particular, it's going to be our API subdomain, which is going to need the cross origin resource sharing because that's where we have the admin panel, which uses the static files. So I can do HTTPS API dot web app testing dot info. And then we can just add all of these methods. And then here I'll put something like 86400 and save chorus configuration. And then I can also add some additional chorus configuration, which will be just linked web app testing.info. This is where the front end app is going to be. Whoops, kind of clicked out of that. Let's do that again. And then for that, I'm also just going to put everything and do 86400. Now, in particular, our front end app isn't going to be using any static files from what we have inside of DigitalOcean Spaces, although in some apps, most likely you will have that happening. If you have, let's say, media files that are in your DigitalOcean Spaces, then you're gonna want the course configuration set up in that case. So I might as well put it there, just because it's something you'll commonly do. So with that, the next thing I'm gonna do is go here, and then I'm going to create and then click on apps. This is going to be the app platform. And then here we have GitHub. You're going to want to connect your GitHub to your digital ocean. And then once you do that, this repository, you're going to see all of your repositories here. And then you can just search for the one you want. So I want full auth API, branch main, and then we're going to have this and auto deploy. I'm going to click next. And then I'm going to add a resource, which is going to be a database. And I'm going to click add. I'm going to choose the name of DB, create and attach. Click on next. And then we're going to want to set up our environment variables. So I'm going to just set up global environment variables. And this part is going to take a little while because we have a lot of environment variables to set up. So what I'm going to do I'm just going to shift this over like this. I'm going to go here. I'm going to grab this, put it in this desktop, go back, and then open this up. So we're going to be doing a lot of copy and pasting. So I just want to make this a little bit easier. So I'll shift this like this, something like that. So first thing, I'm going to want my Django secret key. And then for the value, I'm just going to grab whatever's here. And I'm going to add a little bit to it. All right. Then I'm going to add another environment variable. And then this one, I'm also going to click on this encrypt. And then debug by default is going to be false, so I don't have to add that. Also, development mode will be false by default, so I don't have to add that. But I will need this. And then I'm going to need the SCS secret key. So this part's a little bit tedious, but once it's done, then we're good. Then the region name. And then for domain, it's going to differ. This is going to be linked web app 
testing.info in my case. And then auth cookie secure by default is true, so I don't have to touch this setting. But I will need the Google auth key. Then I'll need the Google auth secret key. And then the Facebook auth key. And finally, Facebook auth secret key. And then I'm gonna encrypt this secret key as well as this secret key. And then I think I also had another secret key somewhere. That was for SES. I'm also gonna encrypt this one. I'm gonna go back down. Next, I'm gonna have my redirect URLs. In this case, I'm gonna have HTTPS colon slash slash linked web app testing dot info slash auth slash Google comma. And then again, HTTPS colon slash slash linked web app testing dot info slash auth slash Facebook. So these are gonna be comma separated. And then we're gonna have a bunch of additional environment variables we also have to set up. So we've got, where's the database settings? There we are. So we're gonna have database URL that we have to set up. And then if we open up, or actually we're already in here. So I think this is where we have this documentation. And then there is a note on database URL on how we set this up. It should be at the bottom. Because here we have a deployment step for this setup here. So one thing we have to do is in run command, we'll have to set this up, but we'll do that a little later. And then here we have database URL, and this is how you set the value. So we're gonna do dollar sign curly brace, the name of our database, which is DB, and then dot database URL, just like how they have here. So I'm just gonna copy this. I'm gonna go back to my digital ocean settings here. I'm just gonna paste that in here. So that's gonna be the value. I'm gonna create another environment variable. And then here I'm gonna have a couple. So that was in my static settings. So I have this AWS S3 access key. I also have this secret key. I'm just gonna add the keys first and then I'll do the values. I'm gonna have the storage bucket name. This I can fill out right now. I called mine full auth bucket. I'm gonna have the region name. This in my case is NYC3. And let's see what else I need. Custom domain. So that one's gonna be spaces.linkedwebapptesting.info. That's what I set up. And that should be it. So now I just have to grab the two values here. So how do we get those? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna bring this back to how it was. And then I'm gonna make this full screen again. And then I'm going to scroll down. Then under API, I'm gonna open up a new tab to open this API. And then here we have spaces keys. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna generate a new key. I'm gonna call this full auth key. I'm gonna create that. And then I can copy this. That's gonna be the value for the access key ID. And then this will be the secret. 
So I'm gonna paste that here and I'm also gonna encrypt that. So now we should have all of our settings here, unless I missed something, <laughs> which I very well might have. Oftentimes things do go wrong during deployment, but who knows, maybe this time it won't. And then also this right here, you can see the region name and also the bucket name. So full auth bucket NYC3. So you can get those values here. So everything should now be good to go. So I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna click next. And also we have one environment variable here. And that is actually this database URL. So we don't actually have to set it up globally. So I'll just remove that, click save. So now we have 16 environment variables and then here we have this one for the database. I'm gonna click next. And then let's see what else we can edit here. So we can't edit the runtime yet. So we're gonna have to do that later. So this is what we got for now. So I'm gonna create these resources. And actually, I did forget to do one thing. And that was this plan. So actually what I wanna do is use a basic plan. So I'm gonna save that and downgrade the plan. So I forgot to do that, but you can always do it later. So it's no big deal. And then we can go into commands go into the run command and then you're going to put in your project name in my case full underscore auth dot wsgi and you have the same exact thing showing in here as well i think it was just a little further up so there it is so gunicorn worker temp directory dev shm the name of your project dot wsgi so that's the same thing we have here. So I'm gonna save that. And that should be everything. So from there, I can go to the build logs and just wait for this to finish. Okay, and there we go. We have our build and deployment successful. However, we're not quite done. Also, while this was going on, I did remember two environment variables that I did miss. So I'm also gonna have to add those in. So it's pretty easy to do, thankfully. So you can just go into here and just add whatever other environment variables you need. So the ones that I missed in particular, if I scroll up, we do need our allowed hosts setting. And then that one is going to be api.linkedwebapptesting.info. And then there's gonna be one more that we need. So if we scroll down, So at the bottom, we set up this cores allowed origins. And here we're gonna have whatever origins are allowed to make requests to this API. So I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna paste this setting in. And the origin we want is HTTPS colon slash slash linked web app testing dot info. So that's gonna be where our front end eventually gets deployed. So I can save that. And then that is going to trigger another deployment. So I'm just gonna wait for that to finish. And then the last thing we're gonna have to do is also set up the custom domain. Cause right now we added that API linked web app testing dot info. Although we didn't configure that. So right now things wouldn't really work. So we have to set that up as well. But first I'm just gonna let this do its thing and then I'll do that after. And there we go. We ended up successfully building and deploying. So now what I can do is I can go to my settings, I can go to domains, and I can add a domain. This is going to be linked web app testing dot info. And then I'm going to say we manage your domain. I'm going to add it. And that's pretty much it. So now it's going to go through this once again. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna quickly go into this domains just to show you something. 
So right now, what we had previously was just these NS records, but we see that additional things did end up getting added here. And also I did make a slight blunder. I just realized I meant to do the subdomain here. So I actually will have to go back and edit that. So let's actually do that. I'm gonna go into domains and then this one, I'm gonna actually end up removing later. So this configuration might take quite a while. So I'm just gonna add api.linkedweb.apptesting.info. We manage your domain and I'm gonna add that. That's gonna run another deployment. But then in my settings, so it looks like this one finished. So I'm gonna now remove it since I don't want that one. That was a slight error on my end. So now we're gonna configure this one instead because we do want our API on this subdomain. So with that, we should now be able to go here, go to domains, and there we go, we have a C name. Now one thing we don't have is our DigitalOcean spaces set up here. That's one thing I expected to see, but for some reason it's not here. So maybe there was something I forgot to configure. So let's go back. Also, we see the static files are here, so that's good. So we set up the CDN. And it seems that the subdomain, oh, okay, so we have to select it here and then click save. So now that should be good. So that's something I forgot to do. So with that, we should now be able to go back here and then we can click on the domains and now we have everything set up. So perfect. So now everything should work, although there is one final step and that's actually outlined in this document as well. So once you go through everything, ah, here it is. So you're gonna to wanna to do a python manage.py migrate and also create super user if you wanna create a super user, which in my case I do. And then also in particular, I wanna do this so I can test if the static files are working in production. So now I can just go into apps, go into the console. And then in here, we have our project. So now we can do a python manage.py migrate. There we go, that ran all of our migrations. And finally, python manage.py create super user. For the email, I'll do admin at linkedweb app testing.info. First name will be Brian, last name Burkich. I'm gonna set my password. And there we go, we have a super user created. So now we can test things out. So I'm gonna go to api.linkedwebapptesting.info slash admin slash, and seems something went wrong. And it turns out it was actually one of the settings that I ended up configuring wrong, of course. I put in allowed hosts as my environment variable when it should have been Django allowed hosts figured it might have something to do with that. So I'm gonna have to edit this and change it to be Django allowed hosts and save that. So that's gonna trigger a rebuild and redeploy. And after that, hopefully there's no other error. Now it is very difficult to go through all this deployment process without a single issue happening, just because there are so many steps and any little typo can just make things go wrong. But anyway, just gonna wait for this to rebuild, redeploy, and then we'll test things out. And there we go, our build and deployment finished up. So now the moment of truth. I'm gonna refresh this page. And it's loading, so let's see what happens. And there we go. We have our Django admin panel and we see CSS styling, which means our static files are working now in production. 
now let's test out logging in. So admin at linked web app testing dot info with my password. And there we go. We can log into the admin panel. Now we didn't really configure anything inside of the admin panel. There's nothing that we're really managing. We didn't even register the users to manage them, but all I really wanted to see was that the static files that we configured for production are working and that we can actually log in here, have all the styling working. So that's really the main thing I want, not really configuring the admin panel. So with that, I can just log out. So we tested that out. So the final thing we have to do now is just test out our production endpoints. So I'm gonna flip back here and now we can send this request and that's gonna be for creating our user. So I'm gonna send this off. And there we go, our user was created. Awesome. So now I'm just gonna copy this production endpoint because I'm gonna be using that. I'm gonna go to user activation, I'm gonna paste it in here. And then I'm just gonna to wanna to edit these values because I'm about to get a link in my email. So here, if I refresh, we got an email. Account activation on full auth. You can also see right here, this is our production domain. So this is where eventually we're gonna have our Next.js application hosted on. And then that's gonna handle this endpoint here and do the post request using the UID and token. But for now, we don't have that. We just have Postman. So that's how we're gonna hit this activation endpoint. So I'm just gonna paste in here. I'm gonna grab the token, I'm gonna to cut it, remove the slash and put the token in here. Then before I send this off, I also wanna test out the user create just to make sure that it fails. And this is also gonna be with my secure password because inside of user create, that's what we have here. And then I'm also going to grab the production domain, put that in here save send the request off it should fail there we go and now if i send this off there we go 204 no content so now if i remake this request there we go access and refresh token awesome and then another thing is that in my cookies we're going to notice we have the cookie set up we have the domain set which is going to be api.mydomain we have the path, HTTP only, and secure is true. So these are getting sent through an SSL connection. So awesome, we got that. Now we can also hit our refresh. And it's also super easy now because we don't have to go into the body and add a refresh token. We can just send the request off. And of course I forgot to adjust the production domain. So I'm gonna put that here. And there we go, got back a new access token, which of course you can grab it from the data, but also in our cookies, it was updated now. Then we got to verify, which we can also hit. There we go, 200, okay. And we can also hit our retrieve user endpoints. So we have to be authorized to hit this. And there we go, we get our user details. We can also test out resetting our password in production. So this is the confirm one. I wanna do this one first. I'm gonna send this request. Then I should receive an email. There it is. And here we have the production URL. So what I want for now is just the UID and token. And then I'm gonna to go to the confirm one, go into the body, paste the contents there. I'm gonna grab the token, cut that, remove the slash and put the token here. And I'm gonna reset the password to this right here, just like we did during development. I'm gonna send this, oh, I forgot to update to the production endpoint. So I'm gonna update that, save and send. There we go, 204 no content, so that should have worked. 
which means that right now with my create endpoint, if I send this off, it should fail. There we go, 401 unauthorized, but if I update the password to what I just reset it to, this should now work. And it does, we got a 200 okay, perfect. And then we can also test out the logout. So I can paste in the production URL, logout, there we go. So now if I try to hit my verify, that should fail. There we go, we have no token. And then that leaves us with only our OAuth endpoints left. So that's the last thing we have to test out. And then for those, we are going to have to configure some things. So first, I'm gonna to have to go into the console cloud google.com. I'm gonna to have to go into the OAuth 2.0 client IDs. And I'm gonna to have to add a URI for both of these. So for the origin, I'm gonna need HTTPS linked web app testing.info. And then for the authorized redirect URIs, I'm gonna need HTTPS linked web app testing.info slash auth slash Google. So this is going to allow this to work in production. And then I'm also going to have to go into here. So this is in my developer Facebook login app. I'm gonna have to go into my valid OAuth redirect URIs. And then here, I'm gonna add HTTPS link to web app testing.info slash auth slash Facebook. That's my valid OAuth redirect URI. I'm gonna save those changes. And then under basic settings, another thing I can do is under app domains, I can add linked web app testing.info. And then also under advanced, another thing you can do is also add domain manager. And you can also add here as well. So I'm gonna do HTTPS linked web app testing.info and that'll be an exact match. And I'll save those changes. So there we go. Right now, everything should be set up for us to test. So let's try it out. I'm gonna copy the production URL. I'm gonna close up some of these things. And first, let's test out Google OAuth 2. I'm gonna paste this in here with the redirect URL. Send that off. And yes, I need to actually change this here to also be the production version. So that's gonna be HTTPS linked web app testing.info slash auth slash Google. So we gotta make sure we have that correct as well. I'm gonna send that. And there we go, authorization URL. So now I can just copy this. And then in a new tab, I'm gonna paste that, click enter. I'm gonna use my John Doe 1357915 account. And there we go. We are now redirected to linked web app testing.info slash auth slash Google, which is perfect. Of course, we don't have our front end running here quite yet, but eventually we will. And this is what's gonna handle that post request, but we can still test out that post request. So I'm gonna grab with these query parameters, the state and the code. So I'm just gonna copy everything that's here. Go back to Postman. I'm gonna open up the Google OAuth 2 login. And then I'm just gonna delete what's here. I'm gonna do question mark paste. And then there's a couple of things I don't need that are here. So I think all of these, so there we go. We just have state and code now. And the other thing I'm gonna have to do is copy the state, go to my cookies, remove the one that was there, add a new one. It's gonna be this state value. And then I'm gonna have to update this to the production URL. So 
So there we go. And with that, we should be good. So let's send this request. There we go. We successfully created an account using Google OAuth 2. And that was in production. So the final thing we're going to test is now Facebook OAuth 2 in production. So first I'm going to go here. I'm going to paste this. And then also I'm going to update the redirect URI. And actually, I'm going to test it also without doing that. So there we go. We get that same error as before. So let's update this. And then we'll send this off. And now we get the authorization URL. So I'm gonna copy that. And then in this case, I'm gonna go into this window here where I have John Edwards. So that's my test Facebook account. I'm gonna paste this in here. And then if we take a look, of course we don't have anything running here, but we are brought to the correct place link to webapptesting.info slash auth slash Facebook, which is where our Next.js app will run in production and handle this post request. But what we can do right now is just grab everything in the query parameters and just copy that. And then I can close this, go back to Postman, open up Facebook OAuth2 login. And then I'm just gonna delete everything here, paste what I just copied. And I'm just gonna remove some of these things I don't need and only have my code in state in here. Then I'm gonna have to update this to the production URL. Paste that there. And the final thing I have to do is grab the state value, go into my cookies, I'll delete the one that's there, create a new one, paste, save. And now when we hit this, it should work. And it does. Awesome. Now we also have Facebook OAuth 2 working in production. So that is super cool. So now our backend API is officially deployed and working. So with that, if you wanted this to be a little bit more production ready, then of course what you can do is with your AWS SCS, push that to a production version because right now, also I'm probably gonna be logged out. Oh, maybe not. So here we have, by default, it's in the sandbox environment, but you'd wanna request production access. So that's one thing you'd wanna do. Another thing is you'd wanna go live with your developers facebook.com. And then with your google.com, you'd probably just wanna create a different set of OAuth 2.0 client IDs and use those for production. And then I'd say, actually there's one more thing, you'd also have to go to your OAuth consent screen and also publish your app because right now it's in testing, but you'd want to publish it and then you would be production ready. So that's pretty much the only things you'd have to do in terms of the Google and Facebook OAuth 2 and then you'd be good to go. So there we go. That's literally our entire app now deployed with DigitalOcean app platform and DigitalOcean spaces. So I'm just going to show one final little thing and this is going to be with our DigitalOcean spaces. And it's not something that would come into play with our app right now, but if you had media files, they would now go inside of the static folder. So that's gonna be the final thing I'm gonna show. We're not gonna test it because we don't really have a way to test it, but I'm just gonna show you how to do it just because it's a common thing you might do. So what you're gonna do in order to have this behavior, so where we have our static settings, which is right here. Right now we have this AWS location we're gonna add another setting, AWS media location, which is gonna be media. Now this right here is not a setting that is part of the Django spaces package. It's just something that we have that we're gonna use and we're gonna set up a custom class, which is going to inherit S3 Boto 3 storage. And then we're gonna apply it here. And it's going to use media instead of static as the folder. So that's gonna be the final thing we do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a file called custom underscore storages.py. Now, ideally, I would like to have this file be in let's say the project folder, except the only problem is then you can't create a path to it. So I think the best place is just in the root for this file. And then I'm just gonna copy this. 
paste it here. And then from storages backends S3 Boto 3, I'm going to import S3 Boto 3 storage. I'm going to create a class which is custom S3 Boto 3 storage. Which is going to inherit this. It's going to set location equal to that setting we made. So I'm going to do from Django conf import settings and settings dot AWS media location, which is what we called it. Just want to make sure these match up. Perfect. And there we go. So that's literally all you'd have to do. And then just um, you'd want to set this to be your custom storages and then custom S3 Boto 3 storage. So this would be the path to it. Now, if we placed this inside of the project, we'd have no way to do like custom storages dot this. Of course, we could also put this inside of like an app folder and then do like users dot custom storages dot this. But there's not really an app where this file really fits in it. So I think the best place is the root. So that's just where I put it. And then with that, I'm just going to git add, git commit. And then just get push origin main. This is also going to showcase something kind of cool, actually. So it's kind of good that I also left this. So if we go back, what we're going to notice is I just push to main, and that's going to trigger an auto deploy. So there we go. We see it's now building, and it's going to deploy. And there's nothing that I need to touch. It's just going to be automated. So anyway, that's going to be everything for the video. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoy this kind of content, please leave a like on the video. Subscribe if you wanna see more of this kind of content. You can also hit that notification bell if you don't have enough notifications in your life. And that'll be everything for this video. I'll see you in the next one.